call the roll, please? Fish. Here. Saltzman. Udaly. <coughs> Here. Fritz. Here. Wheeler. Here. And Robert, if you could read the rules, please. Welcome to the Portland City Council. The City Council represents all Portlanders and meets to do the city's business. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during City Council meetings so everyone can feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. To participate in council meetings, you may sign up in advance with the council clerk's office for communications to speak briefly about any subject. You may also sign up for public testimony on resolutions or the first readings of ordinances. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. When you have 30 seconds left, a yellow light goes on. When your time is done, a red light goes on. If you are in the audience and would like to show your support for something that is said, please feel free to do a thumbs up. If you want to express that you do not support something, please feel free to do a thumbs down. Disruptive conduct, such as shouting or interrupting testimony or council deliberations, will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being ejected for the remainder of the meeting. After being ejected, a person who fails to leave the meeting is subject to arrest for trespass. Thank you for helping your fellow Portlanders feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. Very good. Thank you, Carla. Could you please read item 482? Mm -hmm. 42, approval of the fiscal year 2018-19 budget for the City of Portland. Very good. I'm now convening this meeting of the City of Portland Budget Committee. I'm now opening a hearing to discuss possible uses of state revenue sharing. This hearing is being held by the City Council of Portland, Oregon in compliance with the provisions of the State Revenue Sharing Regulations, ORS 221.770. It's to allow citizens to comment on the possible use of these funds in conjunction with the annual budget process. As proposed for Council adoption, the fiscal year 2018-19 budget anticipates receipts totaling $20,031,436 from state revenue sharing. It has been the case in prior, as has been the case in prior years, it's proposed that this revenue be allocated in equal parts to support fire prevention and police patrol services. Is there anyone here today that wishes to be heard on this subject? You want to go to the sign-up sheets? For the, or this? this is just for the state revenue okay. uh, hearing. There will be time for testimony on the full budget later. Yes, very good. Okay, so I'm now closing this hearing to discuss possible uses of state revenue sharing, and now I'll turn it over to Budget Director Andrew Scott. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Andrew Scott, Director of the City Budget Office. So, um, Andrew, before we go any farther, I want to publicly congratulate you. I've already <laughs> sworn at you behind closed right. doors, but I want <laughs> to publicly <laughs> congratulate you uh, on what is a really tremendous opportunity over at Metro, and they could not have picked a better person for that role, and uh, we're all very proud of you. I, I have always said that our objective at the City of Portland is to recruit top-notch people, cultivate their leadership skills, and then have them go out to the rest of the community, the rest of the world, and uh, use those skills, and you're an excellent example of that. So we're sorry to lose you, uh, but I'm really honored personally that I've had the opportunity to work with you. Thank you, Mayor. I, I appreciate that. It, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about the opportunity and sad uh, to be leaving the city uh, after 15 years as well. And uh, you know, we live and breathe budgets, so we get a little bit emotional about it. So, as my last budget, you know, thank you for setting me up um, to be a little verklempt as we go through this. But um, um, so, we, it, you know, we are uh, here to approve the budget today. 
Um, and um, there are a number of steps that we're going to go through. And so I'm, just, I'm going to outline those a little bit, then we'll, we'll, we'll go through each one of those steps in order. And this is, as those who've been through this process uh, in prior years remember, it, it does get a little bit confusing. Um, you are acting as the budget committee. Um, so there are a number of, of things in local budget law we need to do. One of the first things uh, was to hold that hearing on state shared revenue, which we just did. And so, um, so that is done and taken care of. Um, and I want to remind you a little bit about the steps we've taken so far in the budget process. Um, on April 30th, uh, the mayor proposed his budget um, publicly and announced it and held a press conference. The actual proposed budget document was delivered to council on Monday, May 7th, uh, and then council convened as the um, city budget committee on Thursday, May 10th, to officially hear the mayor's message in his proposed budget and also to take public testimony in a hearing. Um, and those are steps that are necessary to follow before we get to this approved budget stage. Today, council's gonna consider any changes to the proposed budget um, that the mayor put forward. Those changes are going to take two different forms. Um, there are changes that have been included in the document that was filed and that you have before you right now. Those are referred to uh, in the change memo um, part of the document. There are also changes that can be introduced today through amendment, and we have a number of those um, already uh, that have been proposed, and anyone on the budget committee can propose amendments as we go through this process today um, as well. Those individual amendments uh, will be uh, um, put on the table, seconded, and, and considered and voted on individually. Um, all of that's going to come back um, together at the end. So again, here, here's, here's how the process is going to happen. Um, first, we're going to need agreement from the Budget Committee to consider the changes that are in that change memo. That's going to be the first action you take. Second, we're going to open the floor for those amendments. And as I mentioned, each one will be seconded in uh, motion and seconded and then voted on separately. Third, we'll need to take an action to put all of the change memo adjustments and the new amendments on the table for public testimony. That is not a vote to approve the budget. Um, it will feel a little bit like a vote to approve the budget. That is just a vote to get everything on the table so that we, so that the public knows exactly what they're testifying on. Uh, at that point, uh, we open the floor for public testimony. Further amendments can be made after public testimony occurs um, if, if, if necessary. And then finally, you'll come back together to actually approve the budget. Um, and then you will also today, um, uh, um, there will also be uh, approval of the tax levies. And then as a reminder, after today, uh, the budget goes to the Tax Supervising and Conservation Commission. They uh, are required under state law. Um, they have authority to uh, approve our budget as well. So they will spend 20 days reviewing it, asking questions. We'll have a hearing where there will be additional public testimony. That hearing will be on um, June 6th. And then we will come back together one final time, June 7th, to adopt the budget. Um, so with that, we will sort of go back um, to the script. And at this point, Mayor, um, we just need a motion from you to consider changes to the proposed budget as are presented in the memo filed. Approval of the budget of the city is poor. So moved. Second. We have a motion uh, and a second from Commissioner Fritz. And um, so at this point, um, at this point, uh, we go ahead and, and, and talk a little bit about what's in there. We had a work session um, just this past Monday, and so we went through in some detail. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat that and go through that in detail. Um, I will just let you know that, um, you know, in total, um, you know, the approved budget before you is about $5.1 billion. Um, the general fund discretionary is about $553 million with um, $670 million total general fund um, and, and, and 6,576 positions. And that's what was in the proposed budget. Um, in terms of the um, changes that were in the memo as filed, it does add 20.58 FTE in total across the city. Um, it about adds about $12.1 million of additional one time. Um, the bulk of that is carryover, so uh, the actions you took in the spring bump to carry over, we're following those through now. And then, of course, there are a number of non-general fund changes in that change memo as well. Um, I'm happy to take any specific questions about what's in that change memo, but again, we had this discussion on Monday. Um, and if there's no further discussion of that, we can move on to the amendments process. Thank you. So at this time, uh, we allow for individual amendments um, um, to, to, to the change memo, um, can come from any member of the budget committee. Um, each amendment um, should note the amount, the bureau, the purpose, and the funding source. Very we good. do have a list of amendments that were given to us beforehand, um, and we can probably start there and then open the floor for any additional amendments. Very good. Colleagues, I'd like to move to amend attachment D, specifically the budget note titled Community Service Officer Program. Uh, this addresses a Scrivener's error. The note in the OMF section should replicate the language that's currently under the police section. The language currently reads as follows. It says community service officer program. 
Council directs the Police Bureau and the Office of Management and Finance to ensure that the Community Service Officer Program is implemented by January 1st, 2019. Beginning in the fiscal year 2018-19, Community Service, I'm sorry, beginning in fiscal year 2018-19, the Police Bureau and OMF will provide joint quarterly written reports to council offices on the progress towards implementation, including updates on labor negotiations, hiring, CSO training, and CSO staffing, and identify strategies to overcome any delays in the implementation timeline. Do I have a second? Second. We have a second from Commissioner Fish. A question. Please. Um, you referenced the Office of Management and Finance. Is that specifically the Bureau of Human Resources or, or the other entities within the Office of Management and Finance that are responsible for this? That's a great question, Director I Scott. I think the intent here was, was primarily around um, Bureau of Human Resources. There are a number of collective bargaining issues and just classification issues around this, um, around, around this program. Um, it may involve other pieces of OMF, but I think that was the intent was mainly around BHR. Very good, and I'll, I'll check with uh, CAO Reinhardt. I don't, oh, he is here. Tom, is that, did that get that correct? Yes? Good. Okay, he's shaking his head. No, yes. I hadn't. Mayor, I have an I, amendment. I, I, excuse me, I'm in the middle of, of speaking. Um, I hadn't caught the, that issue before. <laughs> it is a bit odd having a, one bureau looking after the labor contract, looking after uh, implementation of a program in another. But that's just something to maybe think I'm, about. I'm, so I'm, I may be misunderstanding your question. So this budget note actually will, will show up both under OMF and under the Police Bureau. It'll be duplicated in both places. Right, but so it says, but essentially OMF is helping to provide the written quarterly reports. And so just checking that, that actually means the Bureau of Human Resources. I, yes, I believe that's the case. Thank you. I think, the, I think the, yes, he's perfectly sat, so I can't see him behind that column, but yes, the <laughs> okay. chief administrative officer is affirming that. Thank you. Very good. Mayor, I have a motion. Commissioner Fish. Yeah, amendment. Um, uh, I, I have a motion to amend attachment D to add the following budget note. Title street sweeping. Uh, during FY 2018-19, BES and PBOT shall work together to define PBOT's total cost of system-wide street cleaning services under the interagency and detail the cost of street cleaning arterial streets for BES to remain compliant with MS4 permits. Uh, BES and PBOT shall also define the quantifiable benefits of streets sweeping to the stormwater system overall. Based upon the results of this analysis, BES shall propose appropriate realignments to the PBOT BES interagency in its requested budget for FY 2019-20. Second. Okay. Commissioner Fritz. Thank you, Mayor. I move to amend attachment D, specifically the budget note titled ADA Compliance CAL Adjustment to increase the CAL, which remind me, Andrew, it stands for Calston. Oh, I'm sorry, current 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 level. Yeah, current. Thank you. Current appropriation level, thank you. Uh, to be representative by to be requested by parks from five hundred thousand to a million dollars. So the um, Budget note will now say ADA compliance CAL adjustment. The City Council directs the Bureau, Portland Bureau of Transportation and Portland Parks and Recreation to request general fund increases of $1 million to their um, financial year 1920 current appropriation level and then use it for ADA compliance. Second. Second. And then secondly, and um, uh, move to amend the business license tax. Um, I think Commissioner Daly may have an additional amendment on this, but let's move with this one first. Um, the current language uh, says that the council commits to uh, avoid further increases in the business license tax, and I would suggest we change that. I request we change that to we'll strive to avoid further increases in the business license tax. Second. That's seconded. Yeah. Commissioner Fish seconded. Yes, Commissioner Fish has seconded that. So those are, those are my amendments. Very good. Commissioner Udaley. Thank you, Mayor. Colleagues, I'd like to move to amendment, amend attachment D to add the following budget note. Portland Police Bureau overtime. The fiscal year 2018-19 adopted budget includes new ongoing funding for 49 new officer positions that will help reduce the Bureau's reliance on backfill overtime. 
Council directs the Portland Police Bureau to continue to provide a monthly report of Bureau overtime usage, but further directs that this monthly report be enhanced with an online dynamic dashboard to act as management tool for Council to track Bureau overtime usage, call volume, and crime rates. Council also directs that the Bureau perform an annual evaluation of its overtime usage that identifies any structural overtime usage issues outlines management strategies undertaken to minimize reliance on overtime and evaluates the impact of additional officer positions once deployed such that future conversations around adding sworn positions are data driven and informed by quantifiable impacts on performance measures. Second. Second. Commissioner uh, Fritz. Uh, Commissioner Saltzman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I make a motion to increase I think Commissioner Udaly still has the, the uh, oh, has you, I'm yeah. sorry, I had a second item oh, that okay. left off this list sorry. and I've been okay. attempting to clarify why it's not on the list, but I'll just read it. Commissioner Udaly. It's a motion to strike the budget note regar regarding the business li license tax increase. I'm moving to strike the BLT budget note because I don't support amending the BLT uh, if any other tax should pass and I don't want to limit any future city council's options. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Commissioner Saltzman. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Uh, I offer an amendment to uh, allocate $60,000 of one-time general fund resources uh, to my office to fund legal assistance for victims of domestic violence, uh, in particular immigration legal assistance. Uh, the funding source of this, of this ad will be uh, a $60,000 one-time reduction to general fund contingency with uh, correlating amendments to attachment B, C, and E as necessary. Second. I have a clarifying uh, question. Um, it's not determined that the um, oversight of the Gateway Domestic Violence Center will continue to be within the Office of Public, the Commissioner of Public Affairs, is that correct? Uh, yes, I think that's correct. So um, we might want to consider whether that language should be amended to um, well, this is a one-time appropriation, and I'll be here for at least half of that fiscal year. So you'll get it out the door before yeah, you're gone. Out the door. Okay, thank you. I, yeah, I would also say that that um, this would the, the the program, the Gateway Center, is in the Commissioner of Public Affairs budget um, in the eighteen nineteen budget. If Council were to move it, the additional funding would move as well. Okay, great, thank you. All right, is that uh, all of the individual amendments, colleagues? I think that's it. Director Scott. Okay. At this point, um, Council um, will, uh, every amendment's been uh, moved and seconded, um, so they're on the table. And at this point, Council um, should go through and vote on each individual amendment. Um, you can take them in this order or any order that you desire. Uh, why don't we just take them in the same order we received them? Um, so I will call the roll on uh, what I'll just call Mayor Wheeler uh, amendment. This is the Scrivener's error around the community service officer program. Is there any further discussion? Carla, please call the roll. Fish? Aye. Saltzman? Aye. Udaly? Aye. Fritz? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The amendment's adopted. Uh, the next is Commissioner Fish's amendment regarding street sweeping. Call the roll. Fish? Aye. Saltzman? Aye. Udaly? Aye. Fritz? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The amendment is adopted. Next is uh, Commissioner Fritz's amendment regarding ADA compliance uh, current appropriation level adjustments. Please call the roll. Fish? Aye. Saltzman? Aye. Udaly? Aye. Fritz? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The I amendment, uh, Commissioner Fritz. Thank you, Mayor. May I suggest we defer voting on my amendments on the business tax to see if Commissioner Udaly's passes? Uh, that is acceptable. We will hold off on that. So we will go to Commissioner Udaly's first motion, which regard is regarding Portland Police Bureau overtime. Please call the roll. Fish. Aye. Saltzman. Aye. Udaly. Aye. Fritz. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment passes. The next is Commissioner Udaly's uh, uh, amendment with regard to the budget note regarding to the business licensing fee. Please call the roll. Fish. Aye. Saltzman. Uh, no. Udaly. Aye. Fritz. 
Um, I'm going to support this because although I appreciate and, and it was absolutely necessary that for the mayor to be discussing with the Portland Business Alliance and others about the business license tax increase, it is the right of the council to, after taking public testimony, set uh, that license fee. So I believe that we should not be, um, well, and we can't type future councils or even this council. And second of all, that um, the mayor being the mayor will do the right thing um, depending on what happens. And so I support this amendment. Aye. Wheeler. I vote no. The motion carries. Uh, and then the last one was Commissioner Saltzman's amendment with regard to the Gateway Domestic Violence Center. Please call the roll. Fish. Aye. Saltzman. Aye. Udaley. Aye. Fritz. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment carries. I believe that's it. I Director believe uh, Commissioner Fritz's amendment is still on the table and needs to either I be... I withdraw that amendment. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, uh, Commissioner Fritz has withdrawn her amendment. Thank you, Commissioner. Great. Um, thank you. So at this point, um, we need uh, a motion and second and a vote to approve all of the budget adjustments included in attachments B, C, D, and uh, of, the, of the memo as amended as you just did. Again, this is not a vote to approve the budget, just to get everything on the table at once for public testimony. So moved. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Carla, please call the roll. Fish. Aye. Saltzman. Aye. Udaley. Aye. Fritz. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Public testimony at this point. Very good. How many folks do we have signed up? Uh, we have seven people signed up. Very good. Three minutes each. Name for the record. If you're a lobbyist, let us know. Uh, we find about six inches between yourself and the microphone is ideal. The microphones slide around. Please, when your three minutes is up, uh, please stop so that I don't have to stop you. Okay. The first three are Alan Ro Rowan. Heathy, or Heather, sorry, Heather, Heather Hoyle, sorry, Hale. Heather, Hale, and Juno Suarez. Good morning. Heather, would you like to start us off, please? Sure. Uh, good afternoon, afternoon. Uh, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, I am here today uh, and thrilled that I get to start this because I came to say thank you. Uh, thank you very much for restoring funding for the Catalytic Investment Initiative. As you know, this provides targeted support for historically underserved business districts in East and North Portland. Uh, the program has been not only a huge success, but in calendar year 2018 generated $100,000 in new privately paid payroll for business districts, making these some incredibly efficient public dollars that are being spent. Thank you very much for restoring that funding um, and creating some stability for this key program. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Appreciate it. Commissioner Fritz. Uh, you forgot to put your name in the record. Oh, Heather Hale, Executive Director, Venture Portland. Thanks for being you here. You deserve the recognition for all the hard work that you do, and thank you for the organization's work, too. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners. My name is Juno Suarez. I'm speaking today on behalf of Portland Democratic Socialists of America. With the closing of the budget season, today is the public's last opportunity to make the case about services that we depend on. Over the past six weeks, you have heard from Portland residents pleading for the funding of vital services. Parents have begged you not to shut down their community centers. Young people have pled that you keep the Youth Paths program. Residents have demanded mental health care and addiction services rather than an expanded militarized police force. All of the constituencies who have mobilized to testify had something in common. They are fighting to preserve underfunded, hollowed out services because every year this budget process is based on a model of austerity. What does austerity mean? It means a city that is perpetually underfunded. It means that even with a booming economy, our elected officials operate with the presupposition that there isn't enough, that resources are scarce. So you force residents to battle against each other over crumbs. Austerity means that even though wealth inequality has never been greater, we have to starve our city out of funding so that the wealthiest won't have to be burdened with paying more. And austerity means that we focus on the immediate necessities every year. But what is missing from this framework is where is the vision for Portland? We don't ever get to fight for a vision of plenty because we are so busy preserving the scraps. And this city has plenty. The wealth is here. As a first step towards redre redressing this divestment from our city, 
Portland DSA has presented our tax plan. This modest marginal tax on the wealthiest residents alone would raise $114 million per year. Universal pre-K would cost about $70 million per year. We'd still have over $40 million to actually improve the lives of residents in this city. We can house all of our residents. We can fully fund education. The real question is, why do we limit ourselves? Why do we allow businesses to dictate the boundaries of what is possible? Why do we accept the meagerness is all that we deserve and all we will ever get? It is time to be bold. It is time to reframe our economy and our politics. A budget is a moral document. And this budget shows that we will keep limping along, cutting to the bone, because we are too afraid to tax the rich and too afraid to fund the city. Please fight for more than austerity. Fight for a vision of a city that works not just for those at the top, but for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners. My name is Alan Rowand. I own Gray Dog Digital, an IT support and consulting company. I'm also the president of the Foster Area Business Association. For the last three years, Foster has participated in Venture Portland's Catalytic Investment Initiative. And with your investment and Venture Portland's support, we've launched two signature events for our district. A holiday tree lighting, which this year generated more than 200 pounds of donated food and clothing for a shelter in our area. And our all ages tasting tour that makes cash, cash registers ring in our food and beverage purveyors along Foster Road. Following a series of racial incidents in our district last year, we partnered with 82nd Avenue and our neighborhood associations to create the Southeast Portland Stands Together, a statement of our shared values. And we've diversified our membership and leadership to bring it in line with the demographics of the community which we serve. Finally, because of this funding, we were able to be a productive partner with the city, county, and joint office of homeless services to ensure plans for the new shelter on Foster will make it the best shelter in Portland. I'm here today to thank you very much for restoring the Catalytic Investment Initiative funds and providing ongoing financial stability to this program and the business districts like Foster that depend on it. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks all three of you. Thank you. Next three are Emily Goldenfields, Olivia Hassenkamp, and Amanda Aguilar Shank. Oh, so Emily's not here. Uh, we'll go with Tina Wyszynski. Start. Yes, oh, I can start. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so my name is Amanda Aguilar Shank. Um, I'm the deputy director at Enlace. We run the National Prison Divestment Campaign, um, as well as the Freedom City Movement, um, which is a movement that builds a vision of what safety looks like for all marginalized communities. Um, and I'm here today to talk about the increase in the Portland Police budget, which we're adamantly opposed to. Um, I've lived here in Portland since 2001. I've lived in North Portland, St. John's, and Portsmouth since 2007. Um, I've personally witnessed um, intense harassment of my family and friends of color. Um, police initiated interactions that end in arrests that were completely unnecessary. Um, I work at 12th and Stark, um, where there's a mission that serves the houseless, and um, witness weekly um, sweeps, um, police incidents, responding to mental health and drug addiction issues um, that escalate in ways that are completely unnecessary. Um, and right now, you know, what I'm seeing in, in our city is that the budget can be used to address some of these issues. Um, the budget can be used to address housing, mental health, um, equity, and instead what we're doing is, is looking at increasing the police budget, which is, is breaking my heart. I don't wanna be traveling around the country and be ashamed of being from Portland, a city that divests from, criminalizes, and over-polices communities of color. That's not the progressive city that I wanna be a part of. Um, and increasingly, that's what I hear when I leave the city. Um, I also, I wanted to share that we, um, at Enlace, we also run a training institute where we've been, um, last year we trained over 200 um, community leaders of color. One of the conversations we have in that institute is looking at what safety is. And so I know that you all want safety. I know that's what we want as well for our communities. 
and wanted to share with you um, some of what um, those 200 plus people came up with in terms of what safety looks like. It looks like educating our communities on how to vote. It looks like um, lifting up our children. It looks like creating dialogue between marginalized community communities. It looks like defunding the police, demilitarizing the country. It looks like funding free public education, safe housing, no gentrification, rent control, fully funded mental health. And so I'm frankly confused about, um, about why we're increasing the police budget when we know there are so many intense gaps in all of these areas that will actually build safety in our communities. Um, and when you hear from, like you did last week, dozens of folks from marginalized communities and receive um, comment after comment, it makes me wonder what side you're on and who you represent in the city of Portland. Um, so I wanted to express my disappointment and urge you to not increase the police budget. Very good, and if, if I could just comment, um, and I'll, I'll make the same recommendation that I made last week, which is I encourage people to actually go through the budget, particularly the public safety budget. We're not going to agree on the need for increased police patrols and foot patrols. I think we have an honest disagreement there. But I do want people to take note of the fact that we are making significant new and record investments in mental health intervention. And I don't mean policed intervention. I mean things like uh, acute mental health treatment beds at Central City Concern. By listening to the community, particularly the houseless community, which you referenced, we've actually added a liaison position in the police bureau to work with and help establish policy uh, around the homeless interactions. We've asked for data collection, auditing resources, and accountability. All of that also gets funded within the Bureau. And importantly, we've made record investments, substantial increases around homeless service. That's prevention, that's emergency shelter. We're making the largest investment by millions of dollars that we've ever made in transition from streets to housing. And last year, I, I think we were all pretty happy with the 5,000 people that we transitioned from the streets into housing, and in some cases, supportive housing. And through the Housing Bureau, uh, by the end of 2019, we'll have more affordable units delivered by a factor of fivefold from the year prior to my taking office. So I, I'd encourage us to find the commonality in the areas where I think we're, we're in real agreement here and see if we can't find ways to work together to address those issues rather than, than being confrontational. But I appreciate your testimony both today and last week. Good afternoon. Hi, uh, my name is Tina Wisinski. Um, I run the Stadium District Business Association and I thank you very much for your time today. Um, we are also members of Venture Portland, which Heather Howell spoke yes. of. Um, uh, we're a pretty new organization. Um, I run the Business District um, Association and we have nearly 50 members who run businesses of a variety of sizes and longevity. In the Stadium District, um, which actually encompasses Kings Hill and Goose Hollow and borders the Pearl District, the West End and the Northwest Knob Hill area. I would like to urge you to reconsider and possibly oppose the proposed changes to the business license tax at this time um, and the owner's compensation deduction. There are concerns about ramifications to the health of their, uh, my members have concerns about ramifications to the health of their businesses and I think it's in part due to perception of a lack of communication and a lack of time to respond about the said proposed changes. It just happened really fast. Um, running a business isn't easy. Ask anyone, and especially ask any small business owner, large ones as well. My members have had to deal with, and I'm sorry to say this out loud, uh, cleaning up uh, human waste, uh, including defecation and vomit on their picnic patio tables. They've had to hire additional staff to hose down patios daily, power wash sidewalks, pick up trash, all of which um, continues to cut into business profitability. profitability. Excuse me. Several of our members um, have staff who have personally been uh, personally and physically been personally and physically threatened, and there is no clear-cut solution to these problems, nor a timeline for when they will end. And that doesn't include other issues they have had to deal with, which I know you guys know about this stuff. Consistent crime related to issues such as car prowls, vandalism, and theft. Uh, the growing problem of continual houseless camping and campsite growth, waking up and ha having to wake up people and ask them, uh, sleeping in the doorway to move and being verbally threatened. 
The business license taxes generate more than $100 million each year to fund city services, and as you know, contributed to a nice $22.7 million budget surplus for the coming year. My members do not understand why this increase is warranted. They do not owe any, any increase at all, really. With this surplus, um, we feel like we don't, they don't feel like they don't need an increase. But we, what we would like to see is using the surplus, much as you said already, um, to clean up the city. The trash everywhere is not helpful and it's a little disgusting to make some better efforts to hold the houseless and transient populations um, accountable for their actions. We don't really see a lot of that happening. And to provide an easier road for businesses and startups so they, so they stop moving out of Multnomah County. Um, please, uh, the city that works doesn't always work for some of the businesses. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon. Hi, um, I am Olivia Hazenkamp. Um, thank you all for your time. I am here, um, this is my third time testifying in front of you all, actually, you may remember me. Um, I'm here with Care Not Cops and in solidarity with Amanda and Juno who spoke. Um, I would just like to respond to um, your response, Mayor, um, that part of the reason I think that we are continuously coming to you all, that so many people, and the people in this room may not know this, but the people who come to the budget forums um, and the last hearing were probably able to come because it wasn't in the middle of the work day um, as this is, so it's really difficult for people to make this time and part of the reason that a lot of people are not here um, to also express their disapproval of the increase in the police budget. But um, I would just like to say that I am again here to demand an immediate freeze on new Pol Portland Police Bureau hires instead of the 49 new positions proposed, as well as to disarm, defund, and dismantle the police to create real safety in our communities. And I know that we disagree on a lot of the ways that safety is um, considered by different communities, but I think that part of the issue is that our the the increases in what you were saying before the new maybe affordable housing that might be coming in the upcoming years it's just not enough it's not enough and investing so much money into the police will never never help people actually be invested in their own communities. The police are not and will never be adequate mental health responders. They are trained to neutralize situations, not de-escalate. They pretty much, in my experience, have always escalated situations. Always, never de-escalated situations. And I do not believe that they are ever capable of doing that, especially in a uniform, especially when people know that they are the tools of the state of repression, basically. Um, so um, we need life-affirming, community-based resources, not more broken windows policing, which is now disguised as community service officers. So I just want to say, again, we really, really do not need more policing in our communities. Thank, thank you. you for being here. Thanks to all three of you. Commissioner Fritz. I just want to respond to what you just said. Thank, thank you for being here, and I do recognize it's, you're representing a lot of people who couldn't be here during the day, so thank you, each of you, for coming. Um, well, Mike Reese was um, police chief, so that's a, a, a few years ago. He did a presentation for council about the number of uh, incidents where people had been safely transported to the hospital. And the number that sticks into my mind was 1,000. And I can't remember whether it, was, whether it was in a year or in three years. But you don't hear about those. So yes, we are all aware of the times when things have not gone well and there have been tragedies. We don't hear about what the times that the police have been able to intervene and help people get services. So I just you know, wanted to put that on the record. Uh, Commissioner Fritz, the, the current referral rate is about 1,000 per year, and the two additional behavioral health unit teams will actually increase that by about 250. So we'll, we'll effectively uh, be able to double our capacity in this budget. And, and I want to be clear, um, while I agree with you that a budget is a moral document, and I've often used that exact language myself, I always figured if an uh, economic archaeologist digs up 
documents from the past, it really does give you a snapshot in time of what priorities were for a community. Um, so it is an apt description, but it is also a s snapshot in time. And with uh, a new police chief on board, and I'm still relatively new here as well, I have a very clear vision in my mind about where I want public safety and where I want the community. And as I said last week, we I hope an area where we're in agreement is we absolutely do need at a fundamentally different level to address particularly mental health and addiction services, both here locally and nationally. And I, I hope that's an area where we're in agreement. Commissioner Fritz. And again, just following up from that, some of the offices that are in this budget are to team up with uh, mental health care workers, what we call the mobile response units. And so we've had, I think, three teams, and now we're going to be expanding that. So that when a family member is concerned or wants a welfare check, um, Often the person, the person who's uh, maybe having a mental health crisis may be a danger to themselves or others. And so it's been the um, protocol to have a police officer go. Obviously, we want the first um, open overture to be somebody with mental health care training and that it, um, the police officer is there as a backup and as a special, tra specially trained person. So that, again, is actually expanding services and getting people into care in a responsible way so that we're, so that people increasingly can call uh, 911 or the non-emergency number if they are concerned about a family member where now they might be concerned that that would not be the right thing to do. Thank you for your testimony. We really appreciate it. Uh, how many more, Carla? I have one more. Just one up. more. Very yes. good. Uh, Thank you. Charles Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, uh, my name is Charles Uragi, and um, just coming as a concerned citizen, um, I learned about the residential infill project uh, through uh, attendance at uh, uh, Selward Neighborhood Association and also through Portland Business Alliance meetings. And I'm coming here to support the historic resource inventory funding. Um, I think the historic resource inventory uh, has to be fully funded. Uh, it'll be an invaluable tool to help uh, make the uh, residential infill project a success. I think this historic resource inventory uh, will uh, help reconcile two very important constituencies uh, regarding the residential infill project. One, uh, ad one uh, constituency advocating for neighborhood charm and stability, and the other uh, uh, advocating for the critical need for new units in a city and nation experiencing a housing shortage. And all of the problems we know, uh, social problems we know associated with uh, the high price of housing, et cetera. Um, historic resource inventory will allow the residential infill project to focus incentives towards uh, flexibility accorded to preservation of historic homes. Uh, this would square the circle of the conflict seemingly between charm and development. Um, Incentives and flexibility will give historic homes the economic value to ensure their preservation and good maintenance. Um, this will also encourage new housing in desirable locations uh, at affordable costs and in housing types uh, that families are actually looking for. The historic resource inventory will be a critical tool in making the residential infill project a success, both as policy and uh, in neighborhood support. Thank you so much. Very good, thank you. That completes testimony. So Director Scott, I think the next uh, item is to vote to approve the budget as amended, is that correct? Yes, I think at this point, um, uh, unless there are any additional amendments, uh, it is to vote to approve as amended. Colleagues, is this, the, fi is this the final vote on the budget the, today? Yes, this is this is the final vote. Yeah, and and if I could just, Mayor, if I could just take thirty Please. seconds um, you you, before you go into that. So uh, just as a reminder, this is the final vote on the approved budget. We have a couple more steps. We'll be back uh, on June seventh, and I, I I will probably have a little bit more to say on June seventh. But I did want to briefly just thank Council um, for making this budget process work. Uh, again, this is my 10th budget, um, and throughout this process, I meet and talk with each of your offices um, throughout the process, and as usual this year, as there are in every year, um, there are areas of agreement, and there are areas of disagreement. Um, but I think throughout it all, this, this council works really hard to get to a compromise and a point of consensus. Um, and I really believe not, not every government does that, and, and the willingness to work together not only makes Portland, I think, the city that it is, but it makes my job a, a heck of a lot easier. So um, thank you very much. For that. Very good. So we are voting now to approve the budget as amended. Carla, please call the roll. Fish. Well, um, thank you, Mayor and colleagues. Um, I am pleased to support this budget. 
It balances the many urgent needs facing Portland while also positioning us for the future. There are a few items I'm especially proud of. For the first time ever, our utility bureaus will be able to help cost burden renters. We're also approving a handful of other new tools and expanding eligibility for more struggling families. This budget includes $3 million new dollars for housing placement services, $2 million of which we're investing in supportive housing, moving us closer to our goal of 2,000 new <coughs> units by the year 2027. Supportive housing is a proven cost-effective way to help many of the people sleeping outside move into a stable home. We're also funding a new position at Prosper Portland to help turn brownfields, land that has contaminated soil or water, into a community asset. This small investment will deliver a huge return to our community. And we're not only um, continuing our support for uh, small businesses in East and North Portland, but we've also made those funds permanent. Venture Portland, which runs the highly successful Catalytic Investment Initiative, will use our modest investment to leverage big wins for small businesses, business owners in underserved parts of our town. Colleagues, every budget uh, presents its own challenges. And I wanna thank each of you and your teams for working collaboratively. This is a good uh, budget and reflects many of our shared values. I wanna thank the community members who've served on the Budget Advisory Committee and all the people who shared their input with us. Finally, as we've previously discussed, our budget process is showing its age. I look forward to working with my council colleagues, staff, and the community over the next year to reform and improve the way we engage the public and make tough budget choices. I also want to thank my team, headed by Sonia Schmansky, for their work uh, in, in getting to this point. Andrew, I would be remiss if I didn't add my own um, comments following the mayor's comments about what a pleasure it has been to serve with you. And I think Commissioner Fritz will agree with me if, uh, when I observe that one of the things that's made our budget process work more effectively and, and for us to be more collaborative was the decision the council made to create an independent budget office. A budget office that served the budget committee as a whole, not the mayor sometimes and the council sometimes. I think that one structural change made it, um, uh, was, was not only good for, was not only a, um, a positive move for accountability and transparency, but I think it's had a very positive impact on our budget deliberations. So you will be missed and thank you for your service. With that, Mayor, I vote aye. Seltzman. Well, I, I guess I'll, I'll pick up on Commissioner Fish's last remarks about, uh, I do also want to uh, add my accolades for uh, Commissioner Fritz's leadership in, in establishing the Independent Budget Office. I think that really has uh, been a dramatic improvement in how we do business, and it does, uh, and you've recruited a very talented, capable staff to, to help us analyze all the bureau budgets, so I, I really do think that was a great step, and I also wish you the best in your your next career as a Deputy Chief Operating Officer at Metro. That sounds like a great uh, great position, and I'm sure you'll do well. Uh, I just want to add my thanks to my colleagues, uh, to the staff of the Budget Office, to all of our personal staffs who labor long and hard, and all the Bureau personnel who labor long and hard on, on crafting these budgets that try to reflect uh, the priorities and the values of, of our city at, at, a, at a point in time, at a fiscal year point in time. And uh, you know, I think we we strive to get it as best we can. But we're we're all humans, and we're all capable of, uh, you know, maybe not getting it right. But uh, that's what we're here for: is to continue to try to get it right and to make sure that our budget does reflect uh, community priorities. And I think this budget does that, and I'm pleased to support it. Hi. You daily. Well, this is the second budget cycle that I've participated in, but only the first full budget cycle, and I will admit it was much more challenging than, than last year's. Um, I personally didn't feel the process worked as well as it could for city bureaus, the public, or for council. Um, the request for the 5% across the board budget co cuts didn't compel bureaus to really get to inefficiencies and cost savings, and many of the budget cuts that were offered were cuts that were alarming to the community and alarming to us, and I think um, <clears throat> just not, not helpful. So by being forced to offer these cut packages 
and alarming and activating community members. Those activated community members predictably showed up at community budget hearings to protest cuts to programs they care about with little or no knowledge or consideration of other budget issues. And while I absolutely um, appreciate and respect everyone's testimony and contribution, it did leave me feeling like we live on different planets um, based on what people's most burning issues are. My most burning issues are people who can't afford housing, our environmental issues. Um, anyhow, uh, so as we know and as we saw, some groups were able to better mobilize than others. And many of the urgent matters that we need to address were not reflected by the turnout. And many voices were barely able to be heard over the din. When all was said and done, community centers were all funded, while other equally or more important programs and initiatives were not. We need a more thoughtful and meaningful process that will enable city bureaus, the public, and the city council to work together in understanding and prioritizing the complex budgeting challenges we face. This budget does do some great work to address our most urgent issues, and I'd like to highlight a few of them. We've dedicated $500,000 to universal defense for people facing unfair and unjust removal and deportation. As our federal administration continues to target and terrorize Portland's immigrant communities, I'm grateful to be in a position to do something about it. This is an important moment, and I'm proud to be part of a council that is on the right side of history on this issue. So I want to thank Mayor Wheeler for including this in his proposed budget and continuing to support it. We've increased our contribution to the Joint Office of Homeless Services by three, at least $3 million, maybe a little bit more. About five. Oh, about five million, wow. I didn't get that memo. Uh, we're serving more people facing challenges around affordability, eviction, and homelessness than ever. Unfortunately, what the city and county are actually doing to address houselessness gets lost in distracting debates about WAPATO and other well-intentioned but not well-informed approaches. Investing $31.2 million in the Joint Office of Homeless Services will fund the hard work that doesn't make headlines but does make a critical difference for thousands of our most vulnerable community members. As previously noted, we're also increasing the business license tax for the first time in decades. The rising tide of prosperity in Portland is clearly not lifting all boats. In fact, as the increasing number of people who are insecure in their housing and becoming homeless demonstrates, things are getting worse, not better, for many people in Portland. Increasing the BLT now is a great first step toward recognizing how we can divert part of that rising tide to help the people who are struggling to stay afloat and ultimately create a safer, more equitable, and prosperous city for all of us. However, I am worried about some of the expenditures in this budget. The council budget office started the budget process with an appeal to consider the sustainability of the city's finances. This budget generates more ongoing resources, but increasing authorized staffing at the Portland Police Bureau by 49 positions comes with significant new permanent funding obligations. Business tax revenues will fluctuate with the economy, we are setting ourselves up for a very difficult conversation by making new ongoing commitments to funding more police officers with a funding source that we know is subject to economic forces beyond our control. Despite my remaining questions and concerns, I do respect and want to support Chief Outlaw as she continues to implement her vision for the PPB. And there are some wins in the police budget. We're getting two additional behavior health unit teams. We're creating a houseless community engagement liaison position. We're funding data analytics to support equity and diversity goals. And we're securing resources for the traffic division to enforce Vision Zero. As well as the mayor's budget note on a deadline for filling the long overdue community service officer positions, which I think there is a lot of remaining confusion about in the community and I would really love uh, true clarity on, on those positions and what functions they'll serve. Um, as well as my budget note on decreasing the Bureau's reliance on overtime, which is an expensive and undesirable practice. There are issues that did not get resolved in this budget, 
I'd like to highlight a couple of the most important issues that need more work. Neighborhood coalition offices. Coalition offices are important partners in our efforts to connect com community to government. The audit in 2016, ONI audit in 2016, revealed what many have known for a long time. East Portland's population continues to grow rapidly while funding for the coalition office has remained the same. It was important that we address this disparity now, which is why we requested additional funding. I'm disappointed that we were not able to secure the additional funding for the East Portland Neighborhood Office. I want to acknowledge that while East Portland has a rapidly growing population, all of the coalition offices are serving more people than they ever have. This is why I'm working hard to reduce the fiscal impact of rebalancing that will need to occur this year. And just to be clear, the rebalancing is taking money away from the other coalitions to fund UPNO more equitably. We've identified $44,000 in existing Bureau fund dollars that we will direct to EPNO in addition to the $30,000 we received in this proposed budget. I'm also working with the budget office to redirect cost savings from my office budget to the coalitions. Uh, and this really is for the coalition directors and members. Um, ONI Director Sukri and I are committed to working with all of the coalitions to develop a long-term method for equitably distributing funding. I also look forward to brainstorming new ways to structure this work and finding efficiencies and cost savings so that we can continue to strengthen all of our neighborhood coalitions. Um, a couple final items. Uh, I had a budget ask for uh, ADU financing pilot, which is I think a little too wonky to go into at this moment, but I do want to reiterate how important it is as we move forward with our residential infill project that we make sure that the benefits of that, of those policies are delivered to uh, property owners who are low and moderate income. And as it stands, the only people who are gonna benefit from RIP are affluent homeowners and developers. And so I plan to send the spend the summer working with my colleagues and community members to develop the support necessary to fund this plan in the fall budget process. Without it, I don't know how I'm gonna support RIP. Finally, accommodations. I'm disappointed that this item was not fully funded. I agree that the city should provide accommodations as part of its normal course of business and that bigger bureaus should use existing resources to comply with the law. Smaller bureaus and their community partners do not have enough ongoing resources to provide accommodations with existing resources. We need a long-term strategy to address this problem. And to be clear, accommodations are language translation, ASL interpreters, bus passes, childcare, the kinds of things that we, accommodations we need to make to ensure participation from the most diverse range of community members as possible. So I think as you can tell from my tone and my comments, this is a compromise budget for me and there have been some hard pills to swallow. Overall, I'm happy that we're able to work together to get to consensus about the budget. During these chaotic times in politics, it's important to demonstrate that local government can work together to overcome differences and make progress on the most urgent issues in our community. So my thanks go out to my colleagues, bureau directors and staff, my office staff, the council budget office, and especially to the community members who serve us in an advisory capacity and all those who came to our budget listening sessions and are and are here today. Aye. Fritz. Well, thank you to everybody who participated in this. I, I believe it's appropriate that we spend so much time on the budget. What you have to do is follow the money and where this money gets allocated, that's what's going to happen in the next year. And for the, for the most part, if the money isn't there, then it's going to be very difficult to make other things happen. So thank you, Mayor Wheeler, for your willingness to work with the business community to propose the increase in the business license fee, which went so much better than the previous attempt. Um, and I very much appreciate that, and, and also for working with your colleagues to address our budget priorities. Thank you to each of my colleagues um, for working collaboratively. Each of us prioritized within our bureau assignments and within the things that we care about, which things were the most important to put into the um, compromise budget. And so, um, like Commissioner New Daily, there are things that I uh, didn't get that I would have loved to have had, and yet I'm very grateful that we were able to get to where we are at. Um, thank you to 
Michael Barté, Trang Lam, Amy, Amy Archer Masters, in, and all of the park staff who were amazing in looking at the budget. Um, parks is still one of only two bureaus with a net cut in this budget, and yet it could have been so much work with, without their diligence. Thank you to the Parks Budget Advisory Committee, which I'm a proud participant in. I, it's uh, always, always a process that we can do better, and so I, I know that we, we will continue looking at how can we make all of these meetings more accessible, more uh, available to, to every voice to be heard. Thank you, Andrew Scott and the City Budget Office. As has already been said, I am really pleased with how the Independent City Budget Office continues to guide this. And it's perhaps um, one of your greatest legacies, Andrew, that I believe it will continue after you're uh, moved on to your next job and that we have the sound basis that uh, no mayor, no council is going to get rid of the City Budget Office or try to affect its independence at this point because of its success in serving all five members of the council, city auditor and the community. Thank you to our community budget advisors and uh, Tim Crail, my chief of staff. This, this, is, this is both of our 10th budget this year. And I'm happy for the most part for where this budget ended up. $15 million in additional revenue changed what would have been an extremely ugly cut year into a year with many important priorities being funded or protected from a t potential cut. I'm very pleased we're shifting $4 million from one time to ongoing resources for the Joint Office of Homeless Services, while adding nearly $3 million of new funding for alternative shelter and housing placement. Let's say again what the Mayor has said several times already today, 5,000 people off the streets and into housing in this past year, 6,000 people who were at risk of becoming homeless and are not. And so, while yes, there are still far too many people, far too many children outside, there are a lot of people who are not because of the work that the mayor has done in leading the Housing Bureau and partnering with Chaka Fori in the Joint Office. I um, have voted for increased funding for the Housing Bureau and for these services every year of office, even during the cut years. And I'm proud about the tens of millions of dollars more that the citizens of Portland, the community of Portland, is willing to dedicate to these services. It's important to note as generous as the people of Portland are, we cannot afford to fix the problem of houselessness across the entire United States. This is a federal problem that has been defunded since uh, President Reagan and continues to be so. And we can do what we can, we will do what we can. It's a statewide problem, it's a national problem. And that's the real core issue that needs to be addressed. I do appreciate the um, person who came and testified about the uh, Stadium District Business Association, also Foster Powell. Uh, I want to do more to help Portland small businesses. I would be interested next year in support in exploring an increase in the gross, rece gross receipts exemption from the current 50,000 to 100,000 uh, with a slight increase again in the uh, business license tax, maybe of 0.05% a revenue neutral tax increase in, that would really help small businesses. And I think we've made a huge step. Uh, when I first ran, uh, which was 10, more than 10 years ago now, uh, I was asked, would you support increasing the owner exemption to $125,000? In other words, that is not taxed, um, th that income. And so we finally got there this year, and I'm very <laughs> pleased to have fulfilled that promise. The next step is to make sure that the very small businesses don't pay anything at all and don't even have to file. So I think that that's something that I'm interested in exploring. So hiring 50 officers, firing, hiring as an, up to 90 officers was the original proposal. As much as we've heard about the police uh, staffing, let's re recognize that this budget is a lot less than was originally uh, requested and I believe is essential. So I'm supporting the proposal. I know there are lingering concerns in the community that additional officers will result, result in more bad outcomes. Training will be crucial to ensure that there is a cultural shift in, in policing in Portland. Training officers are included in this budget. The mayor has been very specific in what is being funded while also recognizing that we have a severe overtime problem with the patrol officers. We have a severe shortage of people despite the, the generous police uh, contract where we've finally been able to fill all of, almost all of the vacant officer positions. Thanks to the courageous uh, position taken by my former col my colleagues on uh, Mayor Hells's council. We've 
getting those recruits in and they are going to be trained and, and out on the streets um, by themselves within a year or so. At the moment, overtime level is unsustainable. Tired officers are dangerous officers, and I don't want people out on the streets patrolling who've worked 80 hours. As somebody who worked in hospitals and seen um, tragedies that can happen when people are tired and more likely to make mistakes, that's just not safe, and that's why I'm supporting this budget. The uh, crucial community service officer program must be a significant part of the staffing solution for the police bureau. I will be watching the progress and I'm very pleased that we have the budget notes specifying exactly what's going to happen for that and for the um, overtime. Thank you, Commissioner Daly, for that. I'm happy to see expansion of the behavioral health unit to provide additional help for those experiencing mental health crises. Uh, Dr. Commissioner Sharon Myron is doing amazing work at the county, looking at the system and decide, determining what needs to be done. And they are responsible for mental health care funding and for mental health care services. So the council continues the work that was done under Mayor Hales and under Mayor, Mayor Adams to try to work better with the county so that the people don't care who's supposed to be providing the services, they want the services provided. And so that's the other piece to remember that while we are increasing funding for those services in the city budget, it, even though we don't have to, the county is doing even more, and so we will continue to work with them on that. I may or may not be the Parks Commissioner when the Mayor reassigns the bureaus. I'm very pleased with the, that the Parks cuts have been restored and, that the priority, and with the priorities that are funded in this budget. My commitment to a vibrant park system began before I was elected to council and will continue as long as I on the, I'm on the council, in fact, as long as I'm a Portlander, whether I'm the Parks Commissioner or not. The reality for parks, and actually for many other bureaus, is that they are not currently on a financially sustainable path. There are both ongoing costs and maintenance backlogs that need to be addressed, as well as Americans with Disabilities Act uh, responsibilities. We discussed some of those on transportation this morning. There are 17 million in uh, parks that we need to figure out how we're going to correct and I believe we should do that. So the exciting part for me in this budget is that we are funding the long range vision plan, the, the Parks 2035 plan, the financial sustainability plan, and the cost recovery plan. So for the first time that I can remember, we're going to be inviting the entire community to talk about not only what do we want from our park system, where do we need more community centers, where do we need uh, repairs to playground equipment, where do we need programs for seniors or people with disabilities, also, how are we going to pay for those? And how are we as Portlanders willing to pay for our park system? Because to me, parks are as a basic infrastructure and they're basic services as much as public safety, police, and fire. That if people don't have constructive things to do, if they don't have healthy ways to um, recreate and exercise, then that's not a healthy community and we pay for it on the wrong end. And so I'm very happy that we're going to be able to collectively, everybody, not be talking about are we cutting this community center or that community center? Are we cutting this program or that program? If we didn't, if parks did not put, had not put forward the packages that they put forward this time, totaling over $3 million, they would have had to have put forward 3 million of other cuts and would have had a similar number of people just uh, being concerned about different programs. And so we need to look collectively, and I say all five members of the council, we all have to decide how are we going to provide those services to the community for the next 15, 20 years. Particularly in uh, some of the things that were, were saved were the uh, operating money for the Fulton and Hillside community centers. People wonder whether going to the budget sessions made a difference. Yes, it did. Fewer police officers in response to the, what we heard. The community centers are funded. Um, we did not fund youth past, and I want to just um, reflect on that because I've been a big supporter of it throughout my time on the council. It's a great program. There is no question it is a great program, and TriMet and the school district should be encouraging students to ride the buses. It is a state mandate that the school boards provide transportation services for their students. That's not a city responsibility. And Mayor Williams was very clear last year that this was the last year that the city was going to do that because we need to fund things that are our responsibility, like housing, like services for people living outside, like um, the things that are in this budget. And so as I believe that the school districts and TriMet need to be sitting down together and figuring out, we, we did fund a pilot for East Portland last year. They determined that yes, it has been successful in helping their students get to school, even though they have far worse service than the rest of the city in Portland public schools. So it's up to them to now make sure that those students can get to school. 
We are um, having one-time funding for preschool so that the very popular Portland Parks and Recreation preschool program is continuing and that people with lower incomes um, can access it and can have first choice at those um, programs. And that's wonderful. Uh, money for rangers and for safety on the East Bank Esplanade and uh, the very... Uh, seemingly mundane, but really important uh, money to fix culverts in Forest Park. So in this budget, you go from the really high profile things to the really, you know what, this is a culvert repair. I'm not going to, nobody, no parks commissioner is going to probably be going and doing a ribbon cutting for the culvert repair, but still, it needs to be done, and so we're fixing things. I'm very pleased that we continue to dedicate half of the one-time money to essential infrastructure in parks, emergency management, and transportation. And this council is being disciplined in doing that and I applaud that. There are many, many good decisions in here. And there's also additional money that um, needs to be reflected when people are saying, where are we getting our funding sources? $3 million from cannabis tax money, recreational cannabis, and over $3 million that Commissioner Udaly and I are going to have a work session later in this year so that we can start looking at every year this money seems to be coming in now on a fairly regular basis. How can we use that to, the, to, the, to fulfill the promises that I made when I campaigned for that ballot measure? And secondly, $3 million from taxing companies, corporations, whose uh, chief executive <coughs> officers make more than 100 times the median income of their workers. So we are, actually, we are actually taxing the rich, and in a way that um, we're not allowed to do head taxes like, like Seattle has done, so that's against the Oregon Constitution. But the CEO tax, which was uh, led by Commissioner Novick, is actually working out to uh, provide a little bit of that uh, balancing of equity between the very affluent and the very uh, unaffluent. And I think that's a good thing. I think we should be looking for more opportunities to do that. Uh, in summary, thank you very much. Uh, the final thing that I'm really happy is in there, the full 1.25 million for open and accountable elections. It's crucial for the success of the program. This is the public financing matching system that we're going to affect for 2020. We hope to start interviewing next week for the program director, and I believe that it's um, another step forward for democracy in the city of Portland, and therefore for democracy in the United States of America. So thank you very much for funding that. Aye. Wheeler. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, this was my first budget process from beginning to end. As you'll recall, last year, uh, I uh, was brought into the budget process part of the way through it. So this was really a necessary first step for my administration. I regard this budget as being foundational. And it will continue to work towards the priorities that I laid out when I ran for this office. Uh, I'm delighted with my colleagues and the number of conversations we had, the level of conversations we had. Uh, yes, the disagreements and debates uh, that we had, I thought they were very important and I value them. And uh, I'm glad that we were able to fund things like the utilities and the parks and transportation and equity and safety. Uh, all of those things are extremely important. I wanna thank the budget staff. Uh, you have probably spent more time with me in the last several months than you have your families, with your kids, your, your spouses. Uh, I'm grateful for that. And I think we did a lot of great work together. I wanna thank my team uh, who spent a ton of time on this as well. Uh, but who I really wanna thank is the public. I never forget, you may think I forget sometimes, but I never forget who I work for. That doesn't mean I'm always able to forge a consensus on every single issue, but I said when I ran and you elected me to this office to focus on certain priorities, and those priorities are addressing the homeless crisis on our streets, addressing the housing affordability issue that continues to be a significant uh, challenge to Portlanders. You elected me to improve economic prosperity across the board and to do so in an equitable manner. And you elected me to modernize our police bureau and increase the accountability of the police bureau. And I feel sometimes as though when I came here and sat in this chair for the first time, I had died and was suddenly reborn as though I never had a past 
that followed me into this chair. And I was thinking about this this morning as we were talking about the folks from Portland Homeless Family Solutions and the Goose Hollow Family Shelter, uh, where I started my volunteer life as an overnight volunteer shelter host, uh, actually decades ago at this point. And as we've had great conversations and terrific testimony, including today around mental health services, uh, I want to remind people, I used to be the Multnomah County Chair. I used to be at the top of the mental health and public health safety net in our community. And I took that responsibility very, very seriously. And if you go back and check the record, you'll see the degree to which that is true. I brought that with me here. And I served for six years as a statewide office holder. I was the state treasurer here for the great state of Oregon for six years. And I brought fiscal responsibility to this chair. And that's why fiscal responsibility was the first thing I talked about when I released my budget to the press uh, a week and a half, two weeks ago. It's because uh, we are exposed to a recession. We are exposed to an economic downturn, and people rely on the city of Portland to provide core services come hell or high water. And so we need to be fiscally responsible in our budget and fiscally sustainable over the long run to be able to continue to deliver those services come hell or high water. This budget does that. It's not perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect budget. But as a foundation for which my administration can build on, it's as perfect as I think we could get it here today. I vote aye. The budget, as amended, is approved. And with that, we get to the boring part, legal stuff. So it's my understanding, Director Scott, uh, we have to approve the tax levies, and I have some language from state statute that I'm compelled to read. Yes, please. Grab your popcorn, everyone. The city shall levy its full permanent rate of $4.5770 4 per $1,000 of assessed value and $17,920,183 for the payment of voter approved general obligation bond principal and interest and $163,748,624 for the obligations for the Fire and Police Disability and Retirement Fund and .4026 per $1,000 of assessed value for the children's levy. Congratulations, Dan. Furthermore, the city shall levy the amounts listed in attachments E for urban renewal collections. I would entertain a motion to vote to approve the tax levies. So moved. We have a motion, second. we have a second. Call the roll, please. Fish? Aye. Saltzman? Aye. Udaley? Aye. Fritz? Taxes pay for services, and thank you to the taxpayers of Portland who are funding this budget that we just passed. Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The motion carries, so the meeting of the City of Portland Budget Committee is now adjourned. And with that, I'm now convening the Prosper Portland Budget Committee for the purpose of approving the fiscal year 2018-19 budget. Carla, could you please read item number 483? Approve the annual budget of Prosper Portland for fiscal year 2018-19. The budget committee members received copies of Prosper Portland's initial budget approval change memo on Tuesday, May 8th, mm -hmm. and a revised budget change memo on Tuesday, May 15th, that amends resolution 7272, which is under consideration today. Uh, do we need to recall the roll for this particular committee? So, Pam, I'm going to ask you, I guess, at this point, Carla, you get a break. Pam, could you please call the roll? Fish? Oh. <laughs> Saltzman? Here. You Daly? Here. Fritz? Here. Wheeler? Here. I'm now calling for a motion to consider the changes to the proposed budget as presented in the change memo and Exhibit A. So moved. We have a motion and a second, and now we have Prosper Portland staff who are going to discuss changes included in the change memo. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler, Commissioners. Um, our uh, budget officer, Tony Barnes, is here to talk through the changes that reflect um, the changes in the proposed budget that the city put forward, um, and we're here to answer any questions that you might have. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler, Commissioners. I'm Tony Barnes, Finance Manager, Prosper Portland. 
Uh, before you are in the resolution is a revised change memo attached uh, exhibit A to the resolution amends the proposed budget presented on May 9th with several adjustments necessary to balance the budget and align the Prosper Portland with the City of Portland budget that was approved uh, just now. Changes being recommended include uh, $200,000 in general fund resources that are programmed for Venture Portland, the catalytic initiative, uh, investment initiative, $150,000 in general fund resources to support the Portland Brownfields program, an increase of $227,000 for community development block grant program funds, associated with the Economic Opportunity Initiative that's based on the federal budget and PHB approved budget. A decrease of $1 million in expenditures in the Working Convention Center URA that won't expand next fiscal year, so we're moving those resources out to uh, following fiscal year based on the timing of uh, planned program expenditures in that district. And then finally, two adjustments to the housing set aside to match the Portland Housing Bureau's approved budget. Uh, both uh, one changes in the Lentz urban renewal area and one in the interstate uh, urban renewal area. So those are based on timing of set-aside expenditures and um, uh, disbursement of cash for, for the set-aside from PHB. And that concludes the recommended changes that's included in uh, Exhibit A uh, to the resolution and the change memo. Very good. Colleagues, any further questions? I'm now calling for individual amendments to the memo from commissioners, if you have any. I don't believe we have any. Therefore, I'm calling for any public testimony. We have one. Let's hear them. Ashley Henry. Come on up, Ashley. Ashley, if you could state your yes, name again. Sure. Thanks. Hello, I'm Ashley Henry. I'm here representing uh, Business for a Better Portland. We're a membership organization uh, here and sent you a letter. Uh, and I, I wanted to thank you for restoring the funding uh, to Prosper Portland's budget that supports underrepresented entrepreneurs. Uh, we were really pleased with the response that we got from um, our members and other companies in Portland. We um, submitted a letter to you that had over 125 companies supporting the work of Prosper Portland to support underrepresented entrepreneurs. Um, our members mostly um, have benefited from countless opportunities that often aren't afforded to underrepresented entrepreneurs, and uh, it was really um, important to us that we utilize this as an opportunity to demonstrate uh, that we believe that when our community thrives as a whole, uh, that's really what creates a more prosperous business economy, and we wanted to uh, call your attention to that uh, budget item and are very grateful that you chose to support it. Um, I also wanted to let you know that subsequent to that, um, there was a, a subcommittee meeting of your Council of Economic Advisors, Mayor, and uh, our board chair, Mata Zapeta, uh, talked with some of the other folks on that uh, subcommittee and suggested that in, uh, in honor of your call for more public-private partnerships that our members would also be called upon to meet the $100,000 uh, match or to match the $100,000 that Prosper Portland provides in technical assistance to the uh, beneficiaries, the companies that benefit from the Inclusive Business Resource Network. So we are about $35,000 towards that $100,000 goal from our members right now. And we'll be putting out a broader request to ask for them to provide in-kind or low bono services to um, the businesses that support that receive support from Prosper Portland. Uh, so I just wanted to let you know that. So, so uh, thank you. Uh, is it director or president, Henry? Oh, I'm the executive director. Your Royal yeah. Highness, yeah. will that suffice? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the executive director, um, you're doing an outstanding job. And uh, I really appreciate you, first of all, taking up the call and second of all, leveraging that with your membership and going out there and selling it to the community, selling it to business owners and operators and building that network of support. It means a lot to me personally, um, and it means a lot to the community at large. Thank you yeah, for that. Thank you. We look forward to working with you again. Very good, thank you. Uh, so that is that for public testimony. I'm now calling to entertain a motion to vote to approve the budget amendments in Exhibit A of the resolution 7 Two seven two as amended. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Now we will uh, vote to approve the budget as amended. Please call the roll, Pam. Fish. Saltzman. Aye. You daily. Well, I'm particularly pleased uh, to see the programs 
uh, for underrepresented entrepreneurs funded. And I want to thank Ashley for her advocacy and for being here today. And it's just really a pleasure to have a progressive business voice um, in, in City Hall. So thank you and I. Fritz? Thank you, Executive Director Kimberly Branham and all of your staff and the Prosper Portland Board. Um, this is a lot smoother than it's been in many years in the past, and so that's a good thing. We do still have long-term questions about the future of Prosper Portland uh, for another day, and this budget does prioritize the work that we want to see out of Prosper Portland. I'm very happy to support it. Aye. Wheeler? I vote aye. The budget is approved as amended, uh, and thank you. All. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you to your team. Thank you to the budget folks. The meeting of the Prosper Portland Budget Committee is now adjourned. Colleagues, our next item is a time certain at 3.30. Why don't we take a five-minute break? We are in recess.
for. Carla, could you please read it? Yes, presentation by Metro staff on a potential regional affordable housing measure. Very good. Uh, colleagues, as you well know, Portland is in a housing emergency. Uh, in addressing this, we as a council have worked diligently with the community, with advocates and activists to craft policy and incentive development to create more housing stock while simultaneously approving methods of stabilizing both renters and owners of housing units with a specific emphasis on affordable housing and low-income renters and homeowners. We have approved a historic housing bond, which up to this point is put into our housing pipeline for development over half of the promised housing, nearly 600 units, within the first year of our five to seven year schedule. And Portland Housing Bureau continues to aggressively move forward to create affordable rental opportunities. We've also continued production through our use of tax increment finance in urban renewal areas and partnered with area nonprofit organizations to create additional housing for the homeless with a commitment to supportive housing, continued to produce housing for our veterans, Portland families, and our youth aging out of foster care. And of course, we look to do a lot more. Our housing emergency is marked by four consecutive years of 5% or more rent increases in the Portland area, with a smaller overall rent increase of 2% in 2017. We know that high opportunity neighborhoods are becoming increasingly inaccessible for many families. We know that our fellow Portland families and residents of color are all but priced out of our most, according to our most recent state of the housing report that outlined this. We know that Portland's population has increased by over 83,000 people between the years 2000 and 2015. And that growth is expected to continue. We're experiencing some growing pains as a city. I think we all agree on that. Colleagues, as one of our governance partners, Metro has created a draft framework plan in an effort to add additional resources to the Tri-County area through a potential housing bond. To present this framework, we welcome Jess Larson and Andy Shaw from Metro. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a brief presentation uh, and would love to then uh, get your questions and feedbacks, feedback on the framework. Um, you outlined the, uh, the nature of the housing crisis here in the city of Portland. And uh, as this map shows, uh, it, it really is also a regional uh, challenge. The, the growing pains of our region uh, have created rent increases across uh, the metro area, across many other uh, regions across the country as well. Uh, so a couple, a couple years back, Metro began a process of examining the nature of the problem across the region, what cities like Portland and others in our jurisdiction are doing to solve the problem, and what role Metro could play. Uh, this last fall, our council directed us to uh, move ahead to examine a potential bond measure for uh, November of this year uh, as, as the most one of the most appropriate things that Metro can do uh, to supplement the work that cities and counties are already doing. Um, so Jess, I think, is now going to uh, begin Good afternoon, walking through the Mayor, Commissioners. Thank you for the chance to be here. My name is Jess Larson. I'm in the Government Affairs Department with uh, my colleague here, Andy Shaw, uh, at Metro. So uh, reiterating just a couple of details and, and diving a little bit more deeply into some of the elements of the framework, but doing so quite quickly so we can uh, indeed hear from you your feedback and um, advice for Metro as we move forward. We are looking at a general obligation bond as the revenue mechanism, uh, which will allow for capital financing of newly constructed affordable homes as well as acquisition of existing housing uh, that may be affordable today but may be lost in affordability on the market as the market changes throughout our region tomorrow. Uh, we also recognize that Metro is not a housing developer and has no intention of creating the bureaucracy to become a housing developer. In fact, we intend to lean on the existing capacity across the region here, especially the city of Portland and your partners at Home Ford, but also the other two housing authorities in Washington and Clackamas County, and three additional cities that act as CDBG entitlement cities, the city of Hillsborough, the city of Beaverton, the city of Gresham, which have much of the capacity already um, in place. So just tell people what CDBG is. <laughs> Community Development Block Grant. Thank you, Commissioner. 
Uh, we've been convening this process for about the last six months, uh, especially located at two uh, advisory tables, one of technical experts from across the region and another of community stakeholder experts from across the region, totaling over 50 um, brilliant partners in this work to help give shape to the framework that we're going to present today. Uh, we've also uh, had community engagement uh, partnerships with many organizations across the region. We are having briefings such as this one across the region over the next few weeks to continue that refining the framework. And there is also a survey online and we've had I think a couple of thousand community members weigh in on their advice to us as we convene this framework. Uh, so these are the elements of the framework, and I'm going to move quite quickly through them. We'll start with core values, the, wor the, the ideas that have really framed, uh, given us the, the, the guiding principles for as we set forward to do this work. Um, as all of the work at Metro is led with racial equity, the work of creating more affordable homes must especially be led by um, advancing racial equity in our communities. We know that much of the need for affordable housing is more is disproportionate experienced by communities of color and the history of housing discrimination um, is long and dates back to the origination of our country and so with this measure we must begin to correct for those wrongs otherwise risk perpetuating those inequities so absolutely every part of this um, framework and all of the work going forward in implementation as a region will be led by racial equity we've also committed to prioritize community members not otherwise served by the market of course the need for housing affordability is wide in our region. All sorts of community members are struggling in this current market of ours um, in becoming a high cost city, but we know the needs are disproportionately felt by communities of color, low income community members, families with low wages, senior citizens on fixed incomes, community members with disabilities, etc. We've also heard a balance of priority around where to locate the new affordable homes, both in creating new access to new opportunities alongside transportation investments, for example, job centers, um, but also investing where communities with low incomes live today to prevent further displacement and, and neighborhood instability. And um, lastly, ensuring that we are being um, good stewards of, of limited resources um, with uh, strong public oversight, administrative caps, which we'll talk further about here. Um, we are proposing in this framework that with a, an investment of a $516.5 million general obligation bond, we can create homes for as many 10, as 10,000 community members across the region and really tens of thousands of community members over the life of these future homes. Uh, we have a plan A and a plan B accounting for the possible outcome, uh, two possible outcomes with the constitutional amendment with which voters will take up in November. So without the constitutional amendment passing, uh, we can anticipate to build about 2,000 homes for about 6,300 uh, individuals. And with the amendment, we can leverage um, both the partnerships of our nonprofit partners, but also low-income housing tax credits and other revenue tools with the general obligation bond, and thereby increase the outcomes um, both in homes and individuals served. Jess, just hold this slide for a second. Um, you know. This is very important for us to see because what you're saying, and I'm, I'm assuming this is reasonably conservative, is that with the amendment, with the constitutional amendment and the uh, allowing us to be more flexible with the dollars, we could potentially produce about 50% more housing. And I think, but I think it's very uh, important that we all stick to this script because there's been there's been a range of numbers that I've heard in the last couple months, and I I operate under the assumption generally that we should. Um, we should uh, uh, under-promise and over-perform. So th this says 50%, and I, I hope that becomes the baseline for our, our public conversation. Thank you. Um, we appreciate that. And yes, indeed, we are working to set high goals, but to ensure that we there are, they are achievable goals. Um, certainly, there are opportunities for local jurisdictions to look at leveraging even further than what our modeling has proposed, but we did not want to require leveraging of all of our jurisdictional partners. So we've modeled modestly, if you will, to make sure that we are in achieving further outcomes, but that are within reach across the region. So um, I, I just want to second that. I, I would rather 
we go out with conservative or more conservative estimates of what we can actually produce in terms of volume and then prove ourselves to be better than that rather than going the other way. And so I, I would ask for us to make sure that we are uh, very conservative because what we're running into through our housing bureau is increased construction costs, increased housing stock costs, increased land costs, and general inflationary factors. And there's nothing the public hates more than being told they're going to get one thing and then find out they bought something less than that. So I'd really encourage, and, and the press will latch on to whatever our initial numbers are, they will hang on to that like a dog on a bone. They will not relent. So I would encourage us to be very, very conservative in, in, as we roll this out. Commissioner Fritz. I know we all have to be very careful about um, not advocating for things that are on the ballot, and the constitutional amendment is on the ballot. So as an elected official, I have a little bit more scope to get it wrong, or a little bit leamy. So let me just explain that to folks who may be watching at home. And you can cor correct me if I'm wrong. The constitutional amendment that we'll all be voting on in November is to allow local bonds to be um, used for affordable housing created by non-profit or non-governmental ent entities. Currently, the Constitution says that if it's a public bond, the public entity has to own that in perpetuity. Is that approximately correct? That's correct. And that's sure. the difference between whether we own and operate it uh, is more expensive than if a non-profit or some other entity owns and operates it. Uh, that is one element of the difference in why, uh, any goals that can be achieved. Another element is the requiring of the lending, the recurrent requirement that government shall not lend credit. And because of that, it makes it difficult to leverage other financing mechanisms like low-income housing tax credits under the current Constitution. So there are a couple of reasons why the Constitutional Amendment will allow for um, further outcomes. And we want to be clear that we're not advocating for or against the amendment as public servants, but trying to accurately reflect what we think the outcomes would look like. Thank you. Uh, a quick reminder, the eligible activities under a general obligation bond are limited to capital financing only. So we're anticipating ex acquisition of buildings, acquisition of land, and the new construction of homes. Um, and this is just further iterating the public ownership element that Commissioner Fritz just uh, reminded us all of. So we can move forward in moving along. Um, a finer point on some of these regional outcomes, it, it, beyond the number of homes and the number of people we aim to serve with this measure, we want to focus the goals um, to, most, uh, to specifically um, serve those community members who who struggle the most in our community to find affordable homes. So that means a focus on achieving as many homes at 30% median family income and below. We know that these are the hard hardest homes to create because they take the deepest public subsidy. Additionally, uh, we have a goal to create at least half of the home sized for families. Again, uh, families are most struggling to find homes that they can afford in this market. A lot of the construction to date is one bedrooms and studios, and we need to make sure there are two, threes, and even four bedrooms available for larger families and intergenerational families in our community. In our measure, in this regional measure, we are um, uh, recommending a uh, affordability up to 80% MFI, but limiting that ex that higher affordability range from 60 to 80% as 10% um, of, of the total bond uh, proceeds to only construct at that level. This allows for deeper cross subsidizing for uh, further cross subsidizing for deeper affordability, and also allows for some home ownership opportunities in the event that the constitutional amendment passes. Could I ask a question, and I don't know if this is a, a, a Jess or an Andy question or both. Uh, on the 30 percent, you know, 45 um, percent you know, of, of homes below 30 percent MFI, um, first of all, I'll just shamelessly say I'm, I'm in the camp that says the more 30 percent and below, the better. I'd frankly like to see it be a majority. I just, I think it's a better talking point, uh, and I think it gets at uh, several issues that we're experiencing around housing affordability here locally. Um, as you know, many people in the zero to 30 percent, particularly the closer you get to 30 percent, are people on SSI, older adults, retirees. They don't necessarily need 
the housing support. Then, of course, there's the permanent supportive piece of zero to 30, where we do have to talk about housing support. Do we have clarity yet, or is there a process through which the housing support piece of this would be clarified around permanent supportive housing for those who need housing support at the zero to 30 percent? We are not, um, and I thank you, Mayor, for that question. We're not at this point uh, requiring or recommending any specific goals around supportive housing, uh, partially because a general obligation bond allows for only capital financing. So the supportive um, housing programming will be made possible through partnerships with our, especially our county, our three counties, who will help to partner and leverage those services in uh, conjunction with the future homes. Uh, but we absolutely agree, and Metro is committed to finding uh, that to to creating those partnerships and committing those resources in conjunction with these future homes so that we can ensure that we are serving the community members we intend to and ensure their success in affordable housing. Great, because I, I, my suspicion is that that is a question that will have to be well baked, uh, particularly with regard to the county and the support services uh, that are to be provided. Uh, Commissioner Udaley, did you have a question? I couldn't tell. I do, yeah. 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 Um, I have a whole list of questions, but I think I'll just jump in as the subject arises. I agree with the mayor. I would really like to see um, the vast majority of these funds focused on zero to 30, uh, 50 at the highest. I think um, I know that there's an issue of the mix, I guess, of of rental levels and ongoing funding and all that, and I'd love to gain a greater understanding, but in my reading of all the data, it seems that what we really need to do is focus our scant public dollars on those extremely low-income households who are at zero to 30. Um, 30 to 50 would be the next uh, range. And that means we're getting people not just off the street and into that zero to 30 housing, but out of unaffordable housing and into affordable housing, which then opens up that range of 50 to 80 that we, we still see a, la a, a need, a, a much, much, le uh, much less great need in, in that 50 to 80 range. So I guess, you know, I'm interested in your thoughts on that and, and why why, I mean, I think we can do it, but <laughs> if, um, why, if you think we can't, why? Um, and I guess, yeah, I'll stick with that one question for Great. now. Thank you, Commissioner, and, and this uh, goes back to Mayor, your question as well. Um, you're absolutely right. The, the goal should be, and we believe is, to maximize the creation of homes at 30% MFI and below, and it does take uh, additional rent incomes to help cover those uh, lower rents because the rent that a 30% MFI household brings in is not enough to cover the monthly operating costs that 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 tenant requires, and um, even if a building itself carries no debt and is fully financed or paid off, uh, the operations uh, are, aren't enough in the case of a 30% MFI apartment. So it does require cross subsidy. Um, in the case of the Portland general obligation bond, there was a, an opportunity to, to leverage the cross subsidizing with a commitment of vouchers from the Portland Housing Bureau, or pardon me, from, the, uh, from Home Forward. And um, that helped to achieve the goals of 45% MFI in the Portland bond. In our case, those, those vouchers are already committed from Home Forward to the current part Portland bond. We have a commitment of uh, 200 vouchers from Washington County and Clackamas County so far to help achieve those goals. Each. But uh, each, uh, each. And so uh, we're, and, and yet we're trying to achieve even more homes on the regional level. So that is part of the reason for needing a higher percent MFI. And actually recognizing that there's more work to do to identify uh, ongoing operating cost resources to keep, to achieve these goals. 
Yeah, I think it's just, I mean, it's a challenging equation because I also don't want exclusively extremely low income housing. I want mixed income housing. We all know that that's, that's the standard to strive for. It's just tough to see any of those dollars going towards housing that I think we could incentivize in the private market. The, and I'm talking about 60 to 80. Um, couldn't we feasibly come up with another funding, another revenue stream to be able to divert <laughs> those dollars to zero to 30? Certainly, I there mean, are other revenue sources working, to talk about it. it yeah. our, our challenge is going to be working with you and others to identify the supportive housing services to match with these dollars in in the in the months and years to come. Um, so uh, that that's where we're focusing our energy on on new resources. You know, as a as a regional program, we're hearing from nonprofits across the the region who who practice in in this field um, that this is a pretty audacious goal to achieve. Uh, and uh, getting some trepidation about the ability to have those rents uh, maintain these buildings at those affordable levels for the duration, uh, for, for the you know for permanently. Uh, so, so we're we're trying to balance that deep affordability, larger bedrooms, uh, with a, 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 an ability to put some that are 60 to 80 and bring a little more rent into the picture for a particular building. That that's the advice we've heard from our technical table. Uh, who's worked through some some pretty significant modeling work to understand how we can get to the place where we are making a bold promise, but a, a promise that we can actually achieve. Okay, I'm sure I'll have more questions. <laughs> Thanks. Let me let me just jump in for a sec. Um, so I have the same concerns. I just want to approach it slightly differently. And first, I want to do a disclosure. I I set three goals for this year. One is to win the primary. Two is to beat cancer, and three is to. Uh, work with uh, our partners to pass the, uh, the regional housing bond, maybe not in all that, maybe not in that order. And uh, we got one down, and now I've agreed to serve on the PAC board, and I'm gonna start doing fundraising with the mayor for this effort, so that's, that's our next big challenge. Um, I realize that in setting the um, framework for the bond, we have to be uh, responsive to what our partners think we have to be responsive to what we think will pass, uh, get uh, majority support from the voters. And we obviously want to set uh, goals that we can achieve. That said, I can't remember a time when we didn't get pushback around permanent supportive housing. Just let's, let's just be clear. Every time this issue comes up, we get pushback. And it isn't from any, it isn't just from one corner. Uh, our nonprofit partners push back because um, sometimes the tenants that they serve are more challenging than others. Sometimes there are gaps in funding, uh, both in terms of affordability and services, in which they don't want to be saddled with. I mean, there's, there's a whole host of reasons why even our nonprofit partners sometimes are resistant. My concern with the number of 45 is that, um, as with my colleagues, I, I think that should be more like a floor than a ceiling. And I think, I think the one thing I'm hearing clearly from this body is that we're not sure 45 is the right number, but we would, not, we would certainly not want to go below 45, and we, we, we would like to see if there's an argument for going above. And the question, so the answer is why, right? Why? Because we're not actually here talking about housing. We're talking about poverty. We're talking about very poor people that don't have choices, and either we provide them with stable housing or we continue to fund the most expensive and least efficient service delivery system ever devised by government, which is what we have as a default. So that's the choice, and I think the public now understands that, which is why permanent supportive housing has, has taken on. It's why the mayor, and I compliment him, set aside $3 million in his budget for services, of which $2 million will be really targeted to, to permanent supportive housing. So let me follow up on Commissioner Udaley's question and ask you, an obvious candidate for where we get those service dollars is the transient lodging tax. And so we are in conversations, the county, the city, and, and metro. And you know, there's millions of dollars that could be allocated to this. Are we getting close to a deal with the three jurisdictional partners to have a, a, a big chunk of that set aside to cover service dollars? We are having a very positive conversation. In fact, Monday, uh, I will be meeting with your staff and county staff to flesh out what a bucket in that bucket system uh, might actually look like. Okay, so Mayor, having been to this rodeo a few times with our colleagues here, 
and I'm, talk, I'm looking at Dan, who probably has been to this rodeo more than anyone else here, but just, just to put a fine point on it, I, I remember that every time we ever talked about a bucket involving the hospitality industry, it got complicated because people, too many hands started getting into the bucket. And we started trying to solve too many worthy, uh, uh, you know, laudable goals uh, through the bucket. And I, I would urge us in this moment to be really focused on the challenge that's in front of us and not be seduced by the idea that a bucket can serve lots of different needs. Because if, uh, it, we, you know, if you do the math, and the math I'm operating under is um, for a typical unit where we need to buy, both buy down the affordability and provide the services, we're talking plus or minus $16,000. All right, so do the, you do the math on that, that's a million six just to get 100 units. So this is, this is not cheap. Again, the alternative is so much more expensive. It's just that it's distributed to the system and we pay for it in many, many different ways that I would hope that building on the mayor's budget with the, set, with the money he has set aside, that the three jurisdictional partners can really focus on the TLT uh, side and, and carve out a big chunk for that. And then um, I think it's incumbent on our other metro regional partners to throw some money in the hopper. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, they are being benefited by this as well. So I would hope that the conversation extends to what can Clackamas and Washington County, for example, do? What, what resources can they bring to the table? Because we, we, cannot, we cannot fund a big chunk of, this, of these affordable units without the service dollars. And, we're, and while it's not gonna be the question before the voters, I think we have an obligation uh, to identify the sources. And I'll, I'll close by recalling, I think, the first conversation that I ever had with Dan Saltzman about transportation. And I had been lulled into a false sense that Dan was the fiscal conservative on the council. <laughs> and we were being asked under the Adams administration to uh, go forward with the orange line, and yet we had no, no plan to pay for it. And Dan was enthusiastically voting to move forward. And I turned to him and said, because I thought at the time Dan was our fiscal conservative, I said, Dan, how can we say yes, give the, you know, the yes sign to this orange line without, without knowing how to fund it. And he said, well, he said invariably, once we set the direction and we set the policy, we find the dollars. They, they be, it's a, it becomes our priority to get those federal dollars, the local dollars, the match. He said, we're very resourceful, but we first have to set the vision. Well, that's what we've done with the 2,000 units of supportive housing. We set the vision and we said, we are going to fund it. And I think we should take the same approach to these service dollars here, that we should commit collectively to find those dollars so that this works. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a nod, so I hope that's, that's <laughs> a positive. You. So uh, before you even answer that, just come back to the transient lodging tax, because I think we're getting a bit off track from this bond measure, which maybe we should get back on it, but um, could you make sure that I'm in the loop for the transient lodging tax, since I'm on the Visitor Development Fund board? I mean, we already get 6%, I believe, for the city's general fund from that. There isn't going to be any more, any more money. So if we're going to divide it differently, that might mean less oh, this money. Is new this is new money that we are currently negotiating. And you and I are on the board, I think, that spends it. We're now talking about the, 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 uh, the, the revenue source. We'd be happy to come and like provide so. a briefing. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. All right. So. Oh, okay. Finishing up real quickly, uh, this is the question of distribution of resources have been of, of great import across the region, wondering um, how the dollars will be distributed back to the local communities and also um, how the goals of achieving these, uh, creating these homes will be distributed. We, uh, through very complicated process, have landed on a simple agreement uh, and recommendation that the uh, resources be di distributed based on assessed value of homes, uh, property tax base, uh, to the three counties. But along with those resources come the commitment of Clackamas County achieving 21% of the goals and outcomes with this housing measure as uh, well as Multnomah County re uh, achieving 45% of the goals with 45% of the resources and Washington County at 34% of resources and goals. Uh, Metro uh, has a unique uh, expertise to lend to the effort of achieving these goals in that we currently uh, operate a transient oriented development program specifically around land acquisition in conjunction with future transportation investments and we're proposing that our role in contributing to the region's efforts 
in achieving those outcomes and uh, creating these homes across the region will be through land acquisitions. So we're proposing that 10% of the resources be um, spent by Metro acquiring land in partnership with 90% of those resources distributed across the region as described in the previous slide to our local partners who will be developing, owning, and operating the, the, the buildings. Could I jump in on this one? So th this one, as you know, is near and dear to my heart. I'm sorry we're nerding out after 4 o'clock in the afternoon on this <laughs> stuff. But first of all, I, I want to applaud your focus on transit-oriented development. I think that is exactly uh, the right kind of thing for Metro to be considering as, as part of this overall program. But I, I still have questions about anti-displacement strategies. Could, could you talk to me about that a little bit? And, and I want to give you a concrete example. There is a housing play that the Housing Bureau has been engaged in. Uh, it was brought to us initially by the community, and we have engaged a landlord. But once the landlord realizes the city of Portland's interested in it, he's basically jacking up the price to a ridiculous degree. So I'm worried about that impact. How, what, what have you thought about or, or what, what is your strategy for thinking about how to develop an anti-displacement strategy where we're not paying top dollar? Mm -hmm. So over, over time, our transit-oriented development program has been geared towards exactly getting ahead of the market. We, we know where we're planning uh, light rail lines, where we're planning a bus rapid transit, and we are able to use the limited federal dollars in the TOD program to acquire lands uh, and to work and to work with developers to add more density. Historically, that's been the focus. Recently, we've developed, we've uh, supported the development of over 800 units uh, of affordable housing with the TOD program. So the the concept is, and 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 you were very close to this with the Southwest Corridor proposal. How do we blend resources into that proposal to uh, acquire lands, sometimes acquire buildings, uh, to get ahead of displacement that could occur when values rise uh, after uh, the investment is made? So. Southwest Corridor is years out before it would actually open and, and have the kind of um, uh, impact on, on real estate. Uh, so the ability to have this program in place that can work in Southwest Corridor, along Division, in other parts of the region where we're planning future uh, transportation and transit improvements, uh, that, that's the goal is to get at that anti-displacement approach. Thank you. I appreciate yep. it. Thanks. Uh, and, and then finally, touching on oversight and administration, um, as with much of our experience in pulling together the framework for this measure, we are learning from the precedent um, and uh, lessons learned through the uh, current housing bond and um, your staff at the Portland Housing Bureau. Um, we have done a, a comprehensive assessment of the capacity across the region to implement these resources in a near term five to seven year time frame. Uh, we ex uh, believe that it is very reasonable to uh, commit our uh, a cap to administrative costs uh, at 7 percent at the regional level with all of the partners involved in administrating this program, both for oversight, compliance, the cost of transacting the bonds, et cetera. Uh, we are also recommending that a community oversight committee be appointed by Metro Council to oversee the regional program year by year, making sure we are tracking on the goals and outcomes we have committed to voters. And first, in order to um, prepare for the implementation of the measure, um, we will, uh, following measure referral, begin to work with the partnering jurisdictions towards create crafting intergovernmental agreements, which have a uh, comprehensive local implementation strategy of how each jurisdiction intends to achieve the goals with their um, reserved um, revenue through this bond and uh, set forth a plan to start implementing as soon as the, uh, or soon thereafter uh, uh, the, after the measure is passed following a brief community uh, engagement process to vet all of those plans. So uh, ensuring comprehensive oversight and um, and efficient administration of the resources. And then I think the last slide is just a, um, a uh, is uh, where we are right now in our timeline, uh, having uh, briefings like this one today uh, in community groups, uh, other commissions and boards across the region. Um, we convene the t final two meetings of the technical and stakeholder advisory tables tomorrow and Monday. And uh, the following Tuesday, the staff recommendation will be given by our COO, Martha Bennett, to our council for their consideration. And it is anticipated they will take up the vote for this measure uh, and potentially refer it to voters on June 7th. 
So that is the completion of our presentation. We welcome any further advice or feedback or clarifying questions you may have. Yeah. Uh, so is your 7% administrative cap written into the ballot measure? Yes, okay. indeed. Okay. Yes. Or will be. Okay. Yes, <laughs> that's the proposal, yes. So um, high opportunity areas, you know, proximity to schools, health care, parks, transportation, and the like, I, I assume this will give credence to that and investments in those areas. So we, we heard a balance of um, both investing in communities where uh, low-income families live, where communities of color live, where there's a common language spoken, where there are other kinds of cultural resources. That was one thing we heard. We also heard create opportunities in places where you, you're proximate to transit, where there are more jobs, where there are schools with uh, lower dropout rates, et cetera. So the, the uh, distribution method that we landed on, uh, assessed value, is really a proxy for a very complicated set of formulas we used uh, that map out where are opportunity neighborhoods and where are existing low-income households who are rent burdened, uh, where does the resource come from, and when you balance that all out, it was awfully close to assessed value. Uh, so that, that felt like a good way to distribute funds out to ensure that communities in Clackamas, communities in Washington, and in Multnomah County are all uh, building homes in both existing communities where low-income families reside and in places where people may, may choose to move to, uh, to, to take access to other opportunities. Very good, thank you. Colleagues, any further questions? Commissioner yeah. Daly. Uh, so we talked about this at one of the MPAC meetings, and I realize that some of what we want to do with the bond is contingent upon the constitutional amendment passing in the fall. I, I'm assuming you're being careful about crafting the language to kind of allow for either outcome. Yes. And has there been any more conversation about any of the bond money being utilized for land trusts or limited equity um, housing cooperatives just to provide home ownership opportunities mm -hmm. for low Yes, we want to we want to craft the measure in a way that allows for uh, jurisdictions to explore that space of, of home ownership. It really only works if the Constitution is changed yeah. to allow the blending of nonprofit pri and public dollars or private and public dollars. And then if Oh, sorry, Jess, go ahead. Uh, to clarify, home ownership in a land trust model because we are committing to voters' permanency and affordability, and Absolutely. that can only be achieved okay. with a land trust. land trust. And if the amendment does pass, does that change the, the equation or the balance between 0 to 30, 30 to 60, 60 to 80? Indeed, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. we, indeed, it makes it more challenging the oh. opportunity to leverage debt means the responsibility to pay back that debt, and it makes the goals towards deep affordability more challenging. Um, we are doing very comprehensive analysis of all of the potential outcomes and um, opportunities and challenges of that reality, and um, are uh, so far being uh, working to solve for keeping the commitment to zero to 30, which may mean leaving some debt unleveraged. Yeah, and then my final question is, uh, why 500,000, or 500 million? It seems low to me. Early polls showed that um, twice that has a good chance of passing with the voters, and I'm just concerned, you know, we're, we're also hearing word of a $2 billion transit or light rail bond, I would like to see the reverse of that, frankly. Um, I don't know how we can support that kind of an uh, investment in light rail when we have seen a pattern of displacement around major transit uh, projects and a rejection in ridership because those low-income community members are being replaced by more affluent residents who don't rely on public transportation. So a couple different so issues on, at on play the, there, but we shouldn't leave any money on the table with this one. On the measure size question, uh, we've heard from a number of, of uh, quarters, uh, go big, think larger than 500. We started with 500 as a sort of um, place to start and a modeling exercise. Uh, we moved it to $516 million in, because that through the modeling work we did, uh, we think we could uh, achieve a service to 10,000 people uh, with the Constitution change, uh, changing. We, th we think that's pretty audacious, uh, but we are hearing from folks, look at what you could do uh, if you asked for more money. Uh, j just a comment on the, the polling. We tested um, a ballot title 
and that got good results. Uh, we tested um, asking people, are you willing to spend $100 or $50 or $25? That got much more positive responses. Um, but, but that's not the actual question that the voters vote on. They vote on the ballot title question. Um, so we're trying to uh, work to understand uh, what's, the, what's the appropriate amount uh, in terms of what can get out the door through our partners, uh, and, but also what uh, the voters we think would be, would be willing to uh, invest. But 516 isn't the last word. It may still... It was the initial framework proposal. That's yeah. correct. Uh, and we're hearing a lot of folks suggest that we think um, north of that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Is there a requirement to spend the money within a certain amount of time? Uh, there is not. Um, <coughs> I'm not familiar with us in any, any of the bond measures that we've run in the past for parks or for the zoo or other, other places um, committing a, uh, a time frame in the measure. Um, we have talked about trying to uh, spend the money in five to seven years. Um, like the goals for how many units, I th the, the voters are going to try to are going to hear that and and will likely uh, hold us to those commitments. But it's not something generally we've put in the requirements of the measure itself. So, because they might probably have looked at the capacity of the construction industry to handle a billion dollars of construction in five to seven years and multiple jurisdictions looking to acquire the right land and move through the development process, make sure the zoning is correct. So many steps along the way that, that just make it take um, some number of years to, to get these homes constructed. But we're, we want to put a time clock on ourselves and on our local jurisdiction partners to get that money out the door in five to seven years. And since it's capital and it's on top of property tax limitations, we can do this one get it very massively successful within five years and then do another one. Correct, it's and like it doesn't levy. cause, it doesn't, it's not like a levy, it doesn't cause compression, it gets paid off over time, yes. Thank you. Commissioner, a couple more questions. Sure. You know, we've been watching the uh, Portland Public School Board struggle with the fact that th despite best intentions, there are market forces which, which um, make it difficult to meet certain commitments. Uh, already, I think the mayor alluded to the inflation in, in construction costs. Mm -hmm. The flip side of that is if you hit a recession, there are projects that, that, that no longer go forward. And as, as, as um, Habitat learned with uh, Mr. Gray's money, they could go and acquire land and, and land bank uh, during a recession. Um, but I think we have to be careful because I think the, the, the general consensus is that we may hit a bump in the, in the market in the next few years. And while that may create some opportunities, it, it may also make it harder for us to do deals if tax credits become less affordable and blah, blah, blah. So mm -hmm. I like the fact that it has gives us the flexibility to, and that it's not committing to a specific ar arbitrary timeline because we're not smarter than the market. <laughs> and the second thing I want to ask you, going, just going back to the service side for a second, I, I seem to recall that Chair Kafori uh, said that she had some dollars as the county chair, which linked up with people coming out of prison or people in mental health crisis, where she might be able to program those dollars a little differently to put services with an apartment. And that was within her discretion. I wonder whether we're having the same conversations with the county chairs of, our other, of the other uh, counties as to whether they have some flexibility with dollars, again, people coming out of jail, mental health, and others, that could be reprogrammed uh, to provide those services. Deborah has a clear understanding of where those pots of money are and, and, and how they relate to uh, uh, state funding, but I would encourage us to, to, to take a look at that. Thank you, Commissioner. That's great advice. Very good. Excellent presentation. Thank you for being here and Thank sharing you for taking this, the time today. this with you. us and obviously to be continued. Yes. Indeed. Thank you we so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, I'm going to shift this around a bit because I don't want to lose our quorum. Can we do 486 next, please? 46, approve application under the multiple unit limited tax exemption program under the inclusionary housing program for Halsey Apartments located at 1515 Northeast 28th Avenue. Very good. So this apartment building, Halsey Apartments, will have eight of the 52 units affordable to households earning up to 80% of area median income for 99 years as part of the inclusionary housing program. 
The eight IH units will be composed of one studio and seven one-bedroom units. The owners, UDG 28th and Halsey LLC, are building a total of 52 new units. The multiple unit limited tax exemption or multi-program is one of the financial incentives provided to inclusionary housing projects, choosing to make units affordable rather than paying a fee in lieu. Each multi-application becomes comes before the City Council for approval. In addition to the 10-year tax exemption provided by the multi, this project will receive an exemption of the affordable housing construction excise tax that otherwise would have been due on the affordable units. This project will join the other 24 private sector projects in the inclusionary housing permit approval pipeline, making a minimum of 167 units affordable in otherwise market rate developments. Greetings. Greetings, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm joined, uh, Shannon Callahan of the Portland Housing Bureau. I'm actually joined by Cassie Graves, our Develop Hi, Incentives um, Program Coordinator who works closely with uh, BDS and all of our um, projects in the pipeline. I know you've already heard the details from the Mayor and we're just here to answer any questions that you may have about this project. Colleagues, any questions? Any public testimony on this item? No one signed up. Call the roll. Saltzman. Uh, looks great. Hi. You daily. Hi. Fritz. It's good to see these coming through. I, I do wonder why we are we required to have public hearings on them. It just that uh, it seems almost uh, administrative at this point, and it's really good to have it being so administrative feeling. Well done. Aye. Wheeler. Good work. Excellent. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Item 487, please. Increased compensation for subrecipient contracts with Legal Aid Services of Oregon and Community Alliance of Tenants in the amount of $100,000. Add a subrecipient contract with JOIN in the amount of $110,000 for the provision of services in support of coordinated eviction prevention. Colleagues, the Portland Housing Bureau is planning to conduct an eviction pilot for specific families who face forcible entry detainers, FEDs, through a combination of referral services, base level legal advice, education, advocacy, and support services. As part of this anti-displacement efforts headed by the Bureau, this specific request is to fund the eviction pilot program. We're working with established nonprofit partners, as you heard, including the Community Alliance of Tenants, Legal Aid Service of Oregon, and JOIN. This collaboration will administer intake, screening, legal advice, and representation. General support has already been expressed by the Multnomah County Circuit Court for this pilot program through, or excuse me, though Portland Housing Bureau does fund existing programs that provide familiar services. The pilot program is being created to improve access in a one-stop methodology and will provide comprehensive eviction prevention services. This pilot is aimed at helping us understand whether a comprehensive approach can aid in providing long-term housing stability for households while simultaneously helping households to navigate through the turbulence of housing instability. Council, if you have any questions about this program, we have uh, Kim McCarty, uh, we have Uma Krishnan from the Housing Bureau, and of course we have Director Callahan. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, uh, just a comment. Um, I'd like to thank our staff for all of the work to develop this uh, pilot project with our partners. Um, households facing eviction or who have an eviction um, are um, unable to rent in our market, often become homeless. If they are able to rent, they are usually living in substandard housing. Um, the, this pilot is especially important to us um, to gather more information, make sure that we can help folks prevent them from homelessness, and we will be happy to bring back the results of this pilot project to you um, and would hope that you would see um, a request to continue this if successful um, in the next budget cycle. Very good. How, when would you uh, think of bringing that report? Uh, we're hoping sometime in December, because it's a short-term project. Fabulous, thank you. Very good, is there any public testimony on oh, this? Oh, I'm sorry, no, I'm Commissioner sorry. Daly. Um, I'm sorry, I may have missed it, but um, do you know about how many households we may be able to serve? I know that we're planning on doing about 50 through direct legal assistance um, so that LASSO or others would represent them, but we're not planning on that just being the total number. Okay. Um, Kim, do you have an estimate? Um, it'll, we estimate approximately 30 
households, um, and then more with more indirect services. Okay, thank you. Very good. Uh, public testimony on this item, Carver. No one signed up. Yes. Uh, one, one person would like to testify. Come on up. <clears throat> good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Lightning. I represent Light Lightning Super Creativity Watchdog. I do approve of the increase in compensation. One of the issues I may have is that I understand you're increasing the Community Alliance of Tenants contract of $25,000 if I'm reading this properly. Again, if you're increasing that does that mean that they've spent their funds or that we're able to look at where the money has gone prior to this? Because you're asking for an increase. So that's just a question I'm posing at this time. Another issue I have is that one of the biggest concerns, I guess, and it, it, I want to make it clear, it refers to this, is that when we were talking the state of the housing in Portland report, and why I'm asking this is that I really feel that by looking at all of the groups that are on here, I wanted to see NAA receive some additional money. And I'll explain to you why, referring to this, is that when you look at the state of the housing report, if you go down every neighborhood, you'll see a decrease for Native Americans in the population from the year of 2000 to 2015. But you don't just see a small decrease. When they were at 7,000 or 12,125 in the year 2000, they dropped through the neighborhoods down to about 4,500. And then if you go down neighborhood by neighborhood, the amount of decrease is alarming to me. It's like, why are so many Native Americans moving out of the neighborhoods? And is it to do with their, their economic condition, and it's the city providing any assistance. And again, I hope that you'll review that report number by number, and understanding what I'm talking about is alarming to me. And it needs to be looked at very close, because if you look at the decrease in population in the neighborhoods to the Native Americans, it's almost every neighborhood. And the numbers are 50% and higher of the population base. It's alarming to me why this is happening at this time. And is, do they need additional funding to stay in the neighborhoods? Do they need assistance to stay in the neighborhoods? Are they able to stay in their current housing in the neighborhoods? But why are we not addressing this? Why are we not looking at that data and saying, this is alarming? This is alarming. And so for my position, I'm hoping NAA might receive additional funding. They will come back with data that will explain why this is taking place in the city, in the neighborhoods, and come back with some information that will allow the public to look at this and say, this is alarming. What are we going to do about it? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your testimony. Please call the roll. Saltzman. Aye. You daily. Very excited about this pilot, and I hope it becomes permanent. Aye. Fritz. Aye. Wheeler. Great work. Thank you. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next item, 485. Authorize limited tax revenue bonds in an amount not to exceed $10.5 million to finance replacement of aging fueling system infrastructure at multiple locations across the city. So colleagues, this ordinance authorizes the issuance of up to $10.5 million of limited tax revenue bonds to finance the replacement of aging fueling stations at four locations in the city. Uh, I want to be clear, our fleet is moving towards electrification and non-carbon based sources of uh, fuel. Uh, however, many of our vehicles, particularly our larger ve vehicles, think fire trucks, uh, large utilities and the, and the like, utility vehicles and the like, still rely on these systems. Uh, many of them are extremely antiquated and they are environmentally 
unsound as well as presenting potential safety hazards. The total estimated cost of replacements is currently eight and a half million. However, due to certain project risks, including the potentially for the potential for the discovery of soil contamination at some of the sites, an additional two million is included in this authorization in the event that remediation is required. We expect to initially fund project costs through a line of credit. Upon determination of the final costs of the project, and that's expected by July 2020, we expect to issue long-term limited tax revenue bonds to provide permanent financing. While the bonds will be full faith and credit obligations of the city, debt service will be paid through charges to city fleet customers based on their fuel usage. Good afternoon. Thank you. Hopefully I got that right. You got it exactly Good. right. Glad to hear uh, <laughs> uh, Eric Johansson, uh, City Debt Manager, BRFS. Um, I really have nothing to add to that. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Colleagues, any questions? Any public testimony on this item? No one said This up. is a non-emergency reading. Excuse me. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Robert's still laughing over there about that one. Uh, 488. Second reading. Amend contract with Just Bucket Excavating Inc. in the amount of $141,860. Accept contract as complete, release retainage, and authorize final payment. Call the roll. Saltzman. Aye. E. Bailey. Aye. Fritz. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. 489. Amend City Comprehensive Financial Management Policy 2.04. Commissioner Saltzman. Want to give it to me? <laughs> you, can, you recognize me? Uh, yeah, I'm yeah, recognizing. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this item really comes out of my service of almost 20 years on the City Council and my belief that we could improve some of our financial policies to make our budgeting process uh, more transparent and make us more accountable uh, to our public. Uh, so the changes are relatively simple, and I'll outline them, and, and if I, if you like, I could talk more about why I think we need to do these. Uh, Commissioner Salzman, could, could I ask a question? And, and I'm, sure. I'm not saying no, I want to be very clear, but it was my understanding that you were not going to present this today. Is that correct, or it obviously oh. is incorrect? Yeah, I was, I was planning to do it today. Okay. So we do have two of our colleagues have left. I actually have an excused absence starting now. Um, well, so if you want to just make your presentation and then we could uh, set it over or something like that. I mean, obviously you want to make the presentation, but we don't have two of our colleagues here. Yeah. Do we, do we have staff to make a presentation or are you just going to do it on your own? Uh, I was going to, Andrew Scott was going to be here to answer any questions. Uh, okay, well, we, why don't we go ahead and, and do the, should we do the presentation and then we can continue it to another day? Is that acceptable? Okay, or we could just do it now, do it all now. We have three of us here. Well, as I say, I, have a, I had a 4.30 excused absence. I have a city, I have a, uh, event, so I'm supposed to be at at five. Well, I, I can be very quick. Uh, it's very, it's a very go straightforward. Ahead. I mean, if, if you're, if the preference, you know, if I'm hearing this, the preference is for this proposal to just go away, then I'd rather you tell me I, that, I, I, I and like, then I'll, I like and I will the go away. I like the proposal, okay. and I, I do want to hear it, but I, I want to make sure we give it the due consideration it deserves. I'm, I'm perfectly happy to hear the presentation today, but I, I think we should then leave it so that our colleagues have a chance to chime in on it. Okay. Does, does I, that make sense? Yes, and I, I have some chiming in to do, too. It's just that I'm getting the anxious. Okay, great. Okay. And we have Director Scott sitting here. Right. Okay. Thank you. So uh, these changes will uh, will do the following. One is uh, it relates to our budget monitoring process or bump process, as as we all know it inside this building, and most people I think outside of the building don't have no idea what the bump process is, but it's adjustments we make to our adopted budget throughout the year, and uh, it's been the policy. The current financial policy is only to make requests for additional general fund resources for emergencies during that current fiscal year. We've gotten away from honoring that policy, and we've begun to allocate excess funding in the bump process for non-emergency purposes, which uh, when we do it that way, and you know, I'm as guilty as anybody, when we do it that way, we are bypassing any public involvement process. We have no budget committees looking at these. We have no uh, 
budget advisory committees or citizen but mayor's budget panel looking at this. It's totally exempt from any public scrutiny. And yet we are uh, spending quite a bit of money lately through of general fund, new resources in the bump process. Uh, I think what really alerted me to this was when we did our fall 2017-2018 uh, fall supplemental budget or fall bump. We created 66 new positions in city government and I believe we spent uh, $28 million in new general fund resources. And again, a process that is more or less invisible to our public. And uh, it just felt we need to do something different. And so what I'm proposing is that w this resolution would require me and who other commissioners in charge who are requesting excess general funds, new general funds in a bump process to certify first that there's not they can't find those funds through realigning within their own bureau's budget, that, that that is not possible. And then secondly, that they would need to offer that as an amendment, as a freestanding amendment during the bump process. Uh, so it wouldn't be part of the bump ordinance. It would have to be offered by that commissioner in the full public view of our meetings that we have on Wednesdays or Thursdays and be you know, voted up or down by all of us as to whether that's a good idea and how to spend new general fund resources. So I think that's probably the one that's uh, maybe the most change in how we do business. My other two changes are simply to, uh, I, I think, bring our special appropriations process uh, a little, a little uh, more discipline. I think that we have to, uh, and this is something we adopted at the Portland Children's Levy from day one, we limit the amount of money we grant to an organization to not exceed 35% of their operating budget because we don't want organizations to become so reliant on us alone, the children's levy, or in this case, I would say the city general fund. So that uh, that would be a limitation. And then we would also direct that organizations seeking a special appropriation may only make that request once every three years. And again, it's designed for the same purposes so the organizations don't become so reliant on the city for their funding that they become again a shadow shadow budget obligation, which we've, we've had in the past where many organizations are so used to getting one-time funding from us that it really becomes an ongoing funding obligation. So I believe that these changes are short, sweet, but they will produce, uh, they will help future city councils in managing the city's finances. And um, as I said, Andrew Scott is here to answer any questions or give any comments if he wants. Very good, come yeah. on up, Director Scott. Well, actually, I'd like to um, defer that part because I'd like to put my concerns or suggestions on the table and then continue the discussion. Okay, well, let's, let's do this. First of all, uh, I want to commend Commissioner Saltzman. I think there, this is a bold and provocative proposal. I think there's a lot of good meat here, and I think it is worthy of a more robust conversation at the, at the end of an eight-hour <laughs> council session on a day when we've been doing budgets. Um, there's some good stuff and worthy stuff, and I, I would like to have a chance to absorb this and think about it. And Director Scott, for as long as I've got you, um, I'd like to ask perhaps some follow-up questions offline, and then let's let's come back and have this conversation. I think it's a good one to have. Can we have a time certain next week to do have this conversation? Yeah, let's see what we can come so up with. So don't end of the agenda. To be clear, I am the co-sponsor of this, so I'd like to make my comments as well. Yeah, oh, okay. absolutely. You bet. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in discussing the financial policy changes, my initial goal was to make the capital set aside dedicated to transportation parks and emergency preparedness per, uh, permanent. There's currently a four-year sunset on the dedication to those particular services. After talking with Commissioner Saltzman, we agreed to pursue a wider set of financial policy reforms to advance fiscal responsibility and sustainability. There are some amendments to the filed resolution which I would like to discuss. So I hope, as I say, I would like to put the policy changes on the table and then carry it over. Uh, some of the things I'd like to discuss, um, in, in addition to the dedication of the set-aside funds, um, Commissioner Saltzman mentioned about the 35% of the operating budget. I think we should add to that, um, except when the grantee has no paid staff because some of the special appropriations, they don't have an operating budget there for a particular something and it's volunteers doing them. So that's something to discuss. Um, 
the, I think there's an opportunity to discuss what we were talking about this morning with the Americans with Disabilities Act, that that should be part of the policies, um, and also potentially something relating to unreinforced masonry and seismic resilience as prioritization in city spending. Um, I think um, there's a, the current financial policy talks about prioritizing maintenance over new facilities. Uh, we need to add to that unless acquisition is necessary to address equitable provisions of services citywide. Uh, we don't just maintain the parks we have, we need to provide parks in, other, in places that don't have them, for example. Um, there's a question of whether the auditor is added to the bump discussions and then the labor costs at the time of the labor agreements. Um, that's something that I'm afraid that the um, system will be gamed and we'll, be, we'll hear from every union, well, we'll have to close six fire stations or cut down, you know, not have the traffic division or whatever. So uh, I'd like to see if there's any kind of honing of the language that we could get to make it clear that, no, you can't put the Washington Monument on the table at the same time as this labor agreement. We, we honestly want you to think of, are there some internal reductions that you could take in order to pay for this? So those are some of the things that I think it would be helpful to discuss. So I, I think this is actually, it, this will be a really good conversation because I, I agree um, that there's an opportunity here to add some fiscal principles. I think there's a, a, I think Commissioner Saltzman is right to have called out the question about what is the purpose of a bump mm -hmm. and do we need to rein that in and do we have a, uh, need to have a conversation about increased discipline around the bump? I think the answer is certainly yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'd like to have those conversations. Commissioner Fritz, I think you've added some good ideas to the table. Do you want to add those as amendments today or would you like us just to continue the conversation and have you put those on the table later? What's, what's your preference? I had uh, proposed them as amendments and uh, I think there's some reason that we couldn't do it. Uh, we have to run them by the city attorney and the chief financial officer as well. Okay, why, why don't we do, uh, do we have space next week, Carla, where we could put this on a time certain, please? Uh, it would be four o'clock on Wednesday. That's after the private for hire coaching. Yeah, that's not going to work. What about this Thursday? What about Wednesday morning sometime? Mm, it'd be 11 o'clock. Okay, I, I, I'd rather take 11 on Wednesday than... Because it'll be the same thing. I'll be completely Yeah, it'll be the same thing next week. Yeah. yeah. Good. So 11 a.m. next Wednesday. Yeah. Time that certain works. Uh, Carla, can you remind me of the date, please? Uh, May 23rd. May 23rd. So we are continuing item 489 to next Wednesday, May 23rd, time certain, 11 a.m. And with that, unless I miss something, we are adjourned. Thank you. That'll actually